Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> if I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, professor of sociology at New York University, Vivek Chibber, author of The Class Matrix, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Russia-Ukraine talks continue <clears throat> as Zelensky acknowledges that Ukraine will not join NATO. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one second. Meanwhile, Zelensky addresses Congress and asks for more aid <clears throat> as Biden announces $1 billion military aid being sent to Ukraine. Meanwhile, speaking of aid, COVID relief aid for this country is completely stalled as the Republicans want pay for us. Meanwhile, nine Democrats get COVID. Nine Democratic uh, lawmakers get COVID after their congressional retreat. Thank God we don't have to worry about that anymore. It's all in the rear view. Oitley Joe Manchin sinks Sarah Bloom Raskin's nomination as she announces she will withdraw from confirmation hearings for her to sit on the Fed. Pfizer seeks its fourth shot for seniors as new data shows that J&J &J pretty effective. North Korea launches another weapon, 10th the past couple of weeks. And this one blows up shortly after takeoff. Hearings will begin in Congress on a massive revamp of the VA. Former Proud Boy leader is jailed pending a January 6th trial. And the Senate approves a bill to make daylight savings time permanent onto the House. We'll see. Lastly, Ohio Republicans have some problems in their Senate primary race. All this and more on today's program. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Pardon my uh, frog in the throat. Sometimes that happens. I think I get, I'm starting to get a little bit of allergies. I've tested multiple times today, actually, so don't worry. Uh, joining me, also, don't worry, I've mm -hmm. tested. Mm -hmm. uh, Emma Vigland. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, yeah. yeah, yeah, you were coughing. It's, it's, we'll be fine. Yeah. You will be, we'll be fine. Yeah, folks, here, here are the air filters going on in here. I was, um, we're not sure if I was uh, directly exposed to someone who had uh, COVID, but someone who's tested last night, I had seen like a day before. Mm. And uh, I have taken multiple tests. Um, and also, uh, as you saw, I just had a coughing fit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we do have, said, yeah, you, before, you may yeah. hear the sound of, may hear the sound of our air filters. We have redeployed the air filters into more strategic locations. Uh, Matt, just so you know, there's an air filter between us. Uh, and also there's one that's pulling right across that way so that the airflow is on the side. Done. Yeah. My request the for open. an air filter between us uh, predated COVID, but I'm glad it's here now. That's right. So. That's right. Matt used to wear a mask in here pre-COVID, hmm. um, just because. He could have seen it coming. 
Yeah. It's operational security. You heard too many of those uh, ad reads where I talked about not using antiperspirant. <laughs> um, so uh, Zelensky addressed uh, our Congress um, uh, just moments ago, I guess. Um, and uh, they, of course, those, these remarks were, were delivered uh, virtually. And um, let's take a listen. In your great history, you have pages that would allow you to understand Ukrainians, understand us now, when you need it right now, when we need you right now. Remember Pearl Harbor, terrible morning of December 7, 1941, when your sky was black from the planes attacking you. Just remember it. Remember September the 11th, a terrible day in 20, 2001, when evil tried to turn your cities, independent territories, in battlefields, when innocent people were attacked, attacked from air. Yes just like no one else expected it. You could not stop it. Our country experience the same every day. Right now, at this moment, every night, for three weeks now, various Ukrainian cities, Odessa and Kharkiv, Chernihiv and Sumy, Zhitomir and Lviv, Mariupol and Dnipro, Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into a source of death for thousands of people. Russian troops have already fired nearly 1,000 missiles at Ukraine. Countless bombs, they use drones to kill us with precision. This is a terror that Europe has not seen, has not seen for 80 years, and we are asking for a reply, for an answer uh, to this uh, terror from the whole world. Is this a lot to ask for? To create a no-fly zone, zone over Ukraine to save people? Is this too much to ask? Humanitarian no-fly zone, something that Ukraine, uh, that Russia would not be able to terrorize our free cities. If this is too much to ask, we offer an alternative. You know what kind of defense systems we need, S-300 and other similar systems. You know how much. Uh, I think that's, I think that, I think that what Zelensky is asking there for is like some type of Iron Dome or something to that effect. Yeah, um, which is understandable from his perspective. It's also... I mean, a no-fly no zone, it, it's incumbent upon the West to also just be disciplined in the, or NATO um, and not grant that request, I think. Of course. Of course. I mean, every uh, – it's to be expected that he would uh, call for it. It's yes. to be expected that this is their perspective. Um, and the the problem is – it's not just a no-fly zone. It is a step into uh, a conflict that um, is basically just opening the door to widen it uh, much more. And it, 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 it can't happen. This is, um, and I think so far at least, the administration is being, um, you know, disciplined despite the fact there's an enormous pressure, it seems to me. Uh, but here is... Um, Here's some of that pressure. Yep. This is uh, Jen Psaki at the White House press conference. Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials have made so clear that what they believe they need the most is more warplanes and fighter jets. So why is the U.S. assessing something different? Why well, does the U.S. believe they know better what Ukraine needs than what Ukrainian officials are saying they need the most? It sounds like, you know, we're pretty dug in on our position when it comes to the no-fly zone, when it comes to uh, the MiGs, uh, despite this growing call, bipartisan call in Congress to shift a little bit. So, to put it bluntly, is Zelensky wasting his time tomorrow? asking for these things. President Zelensky is going to be speaking to Congress tomorrow. He's been pushing for fighter jets, a no-fly zone. You have to hear some of those same requests tomorrow as well. 
Has the administration shift, taking shift on that at all? Though calling for a no fly zone. They're a NATO member. They share a border with Russia. How do we view their calls for a no fly zone? Yeah. And on President Zelensky's address tomorrow, of course, he is expected to ask for more assistance, as my colleague noted. A lot of the U.S. positions on that haven't changed, as you just said, when it comes to the no-fly zone. But on the aircraft specifically, the Pentagon said last week that Secretary Austin said they do not support the transfer of additional fighter aircraft at this time. Is that still the United States' position? Would a, a strike in Poland on supplies or, or anything really uh, automatically be met with a military forceful response? It would be a conversation amongst allies about how to do it. No reports that a Russian drone made its way into uh, Polish airspace before going back to Ukraine and being shot down. Does a drone into Poland count? Uh, former ambassador to Ukraine, Maria Ivanovich, has been quite outspoken recently. And she said, we need to mitigate risk, but it's also true that not taking greater action comes with the risk as well, because Putin is a bully and he only understands strength. Is the president showing enough strength against Putin? Oh, my God. All right. I mean, I think, yeah, we get the idea that the intercept put that together, but uh, it's amazing. Like they, 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 as I've said multiple times on the show, there's a no understanding of what a no fly zone means in the general public. There was that poll that came out. There's a perception that it's some sort of force field or like magical, invisible superhero dome over Ukraine when what it means is shooting down Russian planes. The Russian Air Force is the second largest air force in the world, only second to the United States. This would constitute war. And like you again, it's entirely understandable that uh, Zelensky is asking for this from his perspective. I get it. He wants to protect his people. They're under siege. It's a terrifying situation. But for the press to do this and not, you know, the last times, the few times we use no fly zones, it was against vastly inferior uh, military forces and did not have like a World War III or nuclear type consequence attached to it. Um, the fact that they continue to put that out there without a real weighing of the consequences is unconscionable. It really is. So you're okay with a bully being bullied. You just you want to do a conversation and not a forceful response? Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm invested in America's weakness, and I also apparently uh, also Have you, hate Ukraine. Were you ever bullied in junior high? I was the bully. Okay, all right. And no, so really. when, when – well, the point being is that it's just so bizarre to me that when you're talking about this type of geopolitical conflict that people are literally going back to – this experience from elementary school or this experience from uh, uh, junior high. It's a nuclear and, capability of a bully. I mean, uh, the the dynamic of a bully, it's not the same. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's like, I, like, I, you know, like, Bullies I don't, don't know what the, the, but, but, but I mean, I'm, it's not even the stakes are different. The dynamics, not the same. A bully doesn't have domestic pressures. A bully does not have, power in a, um, a a group of people who could overthrow the bully internally. The, the bully doesn't have a, um, you know, tens or hundreds of years of history of various constituencies uh, that are at play here. The, to use, to, to do the bully thing, it's just like, I mean, I get it when politicians get up there and say this when they're on the stump. But for reporters who are ostensibly yeah. there talking in serious voices so they can appear to have like, you know, like be learned in these topics to use the bully thing is just like, I, I mean, it's infantile, li almost literally. Yeah. It's Almost also worse literally. than that, too, because I there is a an investment, even if it's more subtle to them and they don't perceive it, in the perception of, like, American might and also the investment in conflict for the for conflict's sake. I mean, there are uh, more correspondents in this country uh, uh, push for co more conflict and more action, I should say, for a reason, for a reason. They're invested in it. It's helpful for their career, and it's something that they are, I think, 
there's a subliminal understanding that this is just th- th- this is better for us. Well, I think I think also for, for those people, those 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 people in the White House who are asking those questions, it is the quickest route to being perceived as being serious. Yeah. yeah. Because if you are willing to ask the tough questions to see if you're going to make the tough decisions, which means always when you hear the tough tough choices, tough decisions, hard choices, hard decisions, that is always in the context of uh, of politics or media, it is always deciding that other people are going to suffer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's either you're going to be making uh, sacrifices in terms of like uh, being able to pay your bills, or we're going to be sending your kids or other people's kids to, to die in a war. It is always that. And because you're willing to do that and to make that tough call that, and make that hard decision, it gives you some type of gravitas. I have looked death straight in the eyes and sent other people towards it. Right, not it. your death. That is not, that is not, well, that's what makes it hard. It's one thing to decide that I myself am going to go to war. Yeah. I mean, that's Second in some way, knows. that's an easy decision. I can either make it or not make it. And that's a decision. But it's a hard decision to make too, for right? other yeah. people. Yeah. There's, this, uh, there's this quote Ben Rhodes, a foreign policy guy uh, under Obama, had that pissed a lot of people off, but I think it's true. All these newspapers used to have foreign bureaus. Now they don't. They call us to explain to them what's happening in Moscow and Cairo. Most of the outlets are reporting on world events from Washington. The average reporter we talked to is 27 years old, and their only reporting experience consists of being around political campaigns. That's a sea change. They literally know nothing. And and he was saying that, and and that allowed us to manipulate them. Exactly. But it's a it's a bigger problem than just smart people take advantage of that mm-hmm. situation. Um, we uh, 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 later in the show we'll play this uh, question from Ryan Grimm, which was actually a really uh, smart question and gets to you know how uh, the the potential to get out of this uh, situation. Uh, but uh, before we get to uh, Vivek Chibber on his book, The Class Matrix, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn. Uh, A word from our sponsors today. Uh, As you know, folks, I am always trying to watch what I eat. I have a real problem when I get around anything that's sugary. Oh, I see that Don't the look over there. candy is taken out of my line of sight. I appreciate that. I'm going to assume it's gone from the room so I don't have to worry about it. One of the ways it's I've been able gone. to deal with this, for, <laughs> are you serious? One of the ways <laughs> that I have dealt with this, satisfied my sweet tooth, dealt with late night snacks for a, a, several years now, I feel like it's been. And uh, that is Magic Spoon. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs in each serving, only 140 calories per serving. It is keto friendly. It is gluten free. It is grain free. It is soy free and it is low carb. And Magic Spoon, they allow you now, they have, uh, I think it's like a half a dozen um, great flavors of cereal. Uh, Some flavors my kids love some flavors I love, um, and you can build your own box. You can uh, customize, uh, you can either get a a full box, uh, you know, four, I think it is, uh, that come in a uh, package of cocoa, fruity, uh, frosted, reminds you of the uh, childhood flavors, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, my favorite, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. And you can mix and match those now in, in a box. Every now and then they get some uh, special flavors that come through. Those are also awesome to try. Uh, this is, uh, it's healthy, yet it's also delicious. And it makes it easy uh, for you to feed these to your kids too, because you don't feel bad. Hmm. Go to magicspoon.com slash majority report, grab a custom bundle of cereal. Be sure to use our promo code majority report at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash majority report and use the code majority report to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. 
sponsoring my breakfast many times a week and uh, midnight snacks, hmm. which are actually closer, probably at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. snacks. Yep. I wake up and I'm like, I'm hungry. Damn it. And then I just uh, make a bowl of cereal. It's hard to sleep when you're hungry. Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, the uh, latest IPCC report that came out, not good news. We need a society-wide addressment of climate change, but there's an opportunity, obviously, uh, for all of us uh, to help to the extent that we can. And also, it's, you know, it's not just virtue signaling, it is signaling. And it's not just about virtue, it's about saving money, it's about uh, reducing your carbon footprint, and it's about also suggesting to others that this is doable and we can do it and we should be doing it. So uh, now is the time to go solar. 2022 is the last year of the 26% uh, tax credit before it drops down to 22%. Longtime fan of the show and listener uh, of this program, has become a solar consultant. He's got years of experience working in the solar industry. In fact, he was working for, uh, you know, uh, one of these uh, solar companies, found that in some instances, some of the companies work for, their their leasing programs are a little bit predatory. And he realized that homeowners don't have anybody to help navigate this, both navigate in terms of like finding contractors, navigating, uh, finding what tax breaks and incentives are there. And uh, a lot of homeowners aren't aware of the solar options that are available to them. You can now uh, retrofit a home with solar panels for no money down. Most homeowners that switch over see significant savings starting in their first year, largely due to this uh, tax uh, credit. My Solar Nerd's mission is simple. Help you find the best solar program for your home. Make the transition as easy and smooth as possible. They do it by analyzing your usage finding the best equipment for your needs, determining incentives and financing that you qualify for. And then they project manage the process between you and the installers. They get the permits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do not wait. Like I say, some of those tax credits and incentives are sunsetting. They may be sunsetting in your state. The current 26% tax credit drops down to 22%. Uh, If a project is completed by the end of this year, the homeowner qualifies for the 26%. So there's still time. Some markets that are prone to power outages may qualify for off-grid backup solutions. Majority Report listeners will get a $200 gift card upon installation of their solar system. So check it out. Go to mysolarnerd.com, fill out the inquiry form form now. Make sure you select Majority Report listener for how you heard about My Solar Nerd to receive that $200 gift card upon installation. Check it out. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Vivek Chibber. The Class Matrix Social Theory After the Cultural Turn. We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report, uh, joining uh, myself and Emma Vigeland, Professor Vivek Chibber, Professor of Sociology at New York University, author of The Class Matrix, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn. Uh, Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so, all right, we got a, um, a uh, uh, this is a, sort of an academic uh, read to some extent, but I think it's um, available to everybody, but I want to walk through uh, folks. Um, this is in some ways a slight history of the of, of Marxist theory and um, where you feel that it um, uh, certain turns sort of um, were not successful in addressing uh, a question which is essentially why 
when we have seemingly a broad awareness that capitalism is not working for many, 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 the vast majority of people uh, in our society and in, in many other societies, why do we still have capitalism, um, right? I mean, that is the the, the central question that um, uh, you are revising or adding to Marxist theory to to address. So let's let's go back and give us the the, the history of of that Marxist theory up until the uh, the cultural turn, and tell us what the cultural turn was when we get there. Yeah, thanks. It's not really just Marxist theory, although addressing the the turns within the changes in Marxism is important because for a century this was the theory that guided the left. But really, the, for the entire left, there was an understanding for over 100 years that if you want to figure out how to change capitalism and why capitalism is so hard to change, you've got to look at people's material circumstances, the, the choices that they have, the constraints that they face, and the way in which they try to do the best that they can for themselves in those constraints, and workers being the main, uh, main uh, object here. So the idea was, look, if workers aren't rising up the way everyone thought they would, it has to be because the choices that they have make it really hard for them, really difficult for them to organize around their interests, even though they know that they're being screwed over. Now, that was anarchists believed this, socialists believed this, Marxist socialists believed this, non Marxist socialists. All the disagreements were about how to go about organizing and what your vision of a humane, just society is. There was no disagreement that workers are basically rational, reasonable people trying to do the best they can under their circumstances. Well, what changed in that was starting probably around the 80s or so, it really took hold that it's not that a rational, reasonable response to their constraints that's keeping them where they are, but the, it's that they've internalized a lot of ideology, the culture, the socialization, uh, what they're told by the media, by the church, uh, by politicians. And so they believe what they're told. Now, this had a disastrous effect, in my opinion, uh, in the culture of the left and how we understand capitalism. Because whereas earlier, if you took it for granted that people basically understand their situation, they basically understand that they're being screwed over, they basically understand that they need to do something about it. But the reason they're not doing something about it is because their bosses will fire them or because it's just too hard to organize because they don't have the time to organize, things like that. Then you work on those things with them. And you try to understand the specifics of each situation so that you can make it less intimidating for them. But once you believe that they actually don't really understand their circumstances, that they don't really know what to do, that they don't really understand that they're being uh, exploited or treated badly, you start thinking that they're fools, that they're dupes, that they're easily manipulated. And it drives a wedge between the left and the people who is trying to organize, because now suddenly, instead of organizers thinking, we have to figure out what their conditions are and how to make it better for them to organize, you start thinking, oh, these guys, they don't really understand what's going on, and it's up to us to enlighten them. And it, it generates kind of elitism, and that elitism is now rampant on the left towards working people. So the motivation of the book was to try to show what the problems are in this approach and the disastrous effects that it's had. Okay, and so that idea that um, that uh, that the workers did not understand how they were being exploited um, and was um, submerged that that understanding was uh, submerged or re uh, maybe repressed as, uh, submerged. I think is probably the best word. Um, by all the ideological players that are surrounding them in society is that concept of false consciousness, right? Is that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. And so, yeah. uh, and, and so let's, and, and this was, this turn, the cultural turn came about in, um, in uh, the, the, the early eighties, I guess, is what, because it, there, there had, there wasn't necessarily a response to the question of why capitalism hasn't falled uh, or, or hasn't um, you know uh, fallen up to that point because it appeared like it was going to, right? Yeah, I mean, right the, up the, until the forties. Yeah, yeah. Will you yeah. just like uh, outline that for us? Like, give us a sense of like it was very widely believed that we were on track 
through the the first half of the yes. ninth of the twentieth century that it's just it's it's sort of a matter of time. Yeah, I mean, let's step back for a second. You go back to the nineteenth century. Marx and Marx Engels and Marx and Marx and Engels right there create its own grave diggers was the term they used. Capitalism creates a working class. It exploits that working class. But that class is positioned to overthrow the system because both because it needs to, because it's being treated so badly, and because the whole system runs on its labor. So if, the, if that class holds back its labor or even rises up, the system's gone. And it's just a matter of time before that happens. And the socialist movement is built on that conviction. In the 1890s, the early 1900s, that's when you see the socialist movement coming together. And starting, I would say, in 1905 or so, all the way up until the 1940s, what do we see all across Europe and in much of the developing world, there's revolutions. Regimes are overthrown. If they're not overthrown, they're on the cusp of being overthrown. So it really does look like the system is, is imploding, like it's driving itself into the ground out of its own sort of internal engines. That's what changes after 45. Now, once in the post-war world, it's becoming clear that it's, the system isn't going to collapse, this question becomes important, which is, why doesn't it collapse? It was looking like it would. During that early 20th century, when all these revolutions were occurring, nobody's asking the question, hey, how come capitalism doesn't implode? Because it was imploding. All the questions were, how can we push it further along? How can we accelerate this whole process of capitalism's collapse? It's when, in the 1950s onward, it stabilizes itself that the question arises, why does it remain stable when it's true, as Marx said, or the socialist and anarchist said, Workers are exploited, they are treated badly, they do have an interest in organizing, why don't they? That's when they start thinking, uh, maybe it's culture, maybe it's the ideology. But, but the, the stabilizing force, would you attribute that to the labor movement? Or, uh, I mean, what do you think stabilized it and gave this, it this false sense of security? Well, I mean, I, I don't, my point is that I don't think it's culture. I, I think that what, during this whole revolutionary era, what was overlooked was that it's in exceptional circumstances that workers are able to get organized. And we've lived through that in your lifetime and mine. What we've seen is organizing unions is actually really hard. And in much of the developing world, it's always been the case. There's no big, the, the biggest proportion of unionized workers were always in the West, not in the global South, even after capitalism came there. And in the last 50 years, the proportion of workers in unions has been declining everywhere. So what we see is that the whole episode of an organized working class and a mobilized working class is actually quite exceptional in the history of capitalism. So the question then becomes, what's the norm? What's the baseline situation in capitalism? The baseline is the reason they don't organize, the reason they don't all come together is not because they're duped or not because of ideology. It's because when you get a job, your fundamental concern is holding on to that job because the employer's got the power to hire and fire you. And when you try to organize, you've got to do it in circumstances that it's more likely that you'll lose your job than you'll bring other people together with you. And when you try to bring them together with you, each and every person now has to come together on a platform in which people have different needs and different obligations to each other. You've got to agree on what you're going to fight for. You're going to agree whether it's paid vacations that you prioritize, or whether it's medical care, whether it's a, the wage level, or whether it's the pace of work. The, bringing people together around these interests, escaping the eye of the boss, figuring out what a good strategy is, these are all material, structural constraints that workers have, even if they know that they're being treated like they're being exploited and treated badly. So my argument for what stabilizes the system is the mundane everyday facts about the power dynamics, the power imbalance between employer and employee, worker and boss, and the mundane facts about all the resources and all the costs that they have to take on to organize themselves. It doesn't take ideology to get them to, to move away from that. It's just the bare structural facts about where they are. And, and, and you label that dynamic, at least in terms of the way that um, the, 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 the worker approaches that as resignation. And I want to I want to I, I want exactly. to get I want to I want to come back to that. But I, there's still one question in that moment where. 
the question is um when it when when things stabilize or there's awareness of a stabilization in the 1950s and it's uh and then the the question is is like you know why is it stabilized is answered at that moment by the cultural turn but why yes. was the question wh why was the question why is it stabilized as opposed to what were the factors that changed uh the the situation in other words if you know prior to world war ii there's this sense that like this is impending it's a question of time we can try you know things to accelerate it or or, or not but this is imp this is this is happening and if you looked around you had every reason to believe that yeah what the where was the question of like what changed what over the course of these 10 years or whatever it was i mean it's obviously there was a world war but what yeah. what what about the response to the war that inhibited all of these things, or was it like, you know, like uh, uh you know, was it was it Taft Hartley, uh, or, or was it or what you know, like was it was there some you know uh, Bruce Lee kidney punch that like three weeks later is when you die? Like what what happened during that time, and why wasn't why is not not examined as a way of bringing out what a response to the stabilization that was being seen, uh, you know, in the fifties, uh, uh, addressed, you know, in the fifties and sixties, I don't think this cultural answer to the question was ruled a roost the way it did by the eighties and nineties. If we trace back the, this whole turn to culture in the eighties, we can trace it back to the fifties as when, this line of thinking begins and starts gathering steam. But actually, in the 50s and 60s, when there was still a trade union movement, there were still communist parties and socialist parties, they were asking the questions, Sam, the way you've just posed them, which is not that, oh, there's some deep, dark secret in capitalism that we missed before. They were thinking in terms of there's, a, there's something has changed between the 30s and the 50s that's made things a lot harder for us. And they did look at things like the post-war boom, the enormous rise in working class standards of living, the fact that unions have become compromised and they've kind of bought into the system and they're more in the job of managing workers rather than mobilizing workers. There's, the strain of thought was very much there. And you can think of the 50s and 60s as a time when there's these two streams of thought within the left. One is this kind of cultural thinking and the other is more strategic, more looking at the facts on the ground and what's changed on the ground. What happens is, by the 70s, the social groups, social organizations that are thinking in a strategic way, the way you're saying, they're getting their asses kicked. They are in retreat. The left is collapsing. The trade unionists are in the, the left wing of the trade union movement is in retreat everywhere. And the thinking about capitalism is taken over by professional academics, by professional intellectuals. And in that class of people, it really doesn't pay to be talking about strategic dilemmas in organizing against capitalism and what's changed for organizers because they don't do any of the organizing and their professional interests aren't bound up with the success of labor organizing. They're, first of all, they're very distant from everyday concerns and lives of workers. So it's easy for them to think the problem is in people's consciousness. The problem is in people's orientation to the world and also, it just is a lot easier to get along as an academic if you're saying that the world out there is all a matter of perception. It's all a matter of how you see it rather than a fight between contending interests and contending forces, which is the way the left thought of it. So on the one hand, you get the, a labor movement and a socialist movement that's being defeated and driven back. And so strategic thinking is declining on the left. And within the intelligentsia, you get this embrace of a very idealistic, moralized, cultural way of looking at the world because it's the way they see the world and it, it does have fewer professional costs. And so that's why by the 80s, this becomes a dominant trend. And it's no surprise that now, today, for the first time in 40, 45 years, in my opinion, you're seeing strategic thinking reemerge on the left. Why? It's because there is actual organizing going on. There's actual fights around policy issues that for the first time is around real issues and not just, just culture wars that the media promotes. It came from outside the academy. It didn't come from inside. It came from outside universities. 
Otherwise, you would have seen this stuff going on forever and ever. I, I mean, and and I think to some extent, I mean, it it feels to me that some of it was there was also sort of like elements of the academy, if you will, that were sort of like shoved to like into some sort of like third place between workers and what the academy had enjoyed, you know, over the past 40, 50 years, right? Like you had a lot of like, you, you, I mean, I'm thinking about uh, the the strikes that started in Wisconsin were started by, you know, TAs and, uh, you know, people who were being exploited in the academy in a way that maybe there wasn't that type of exploitation before. And they, they, yeah. they, there were, there were, there were sympathies that were, sort of developed, I guess, or people perceive yeah, that, that, that has given more of a base for a more kind of materialist thinking uh, about politics now. It, it's limited. You know, the, the teacher strikes and all that, uh, school teachers, secondary school teachers, elementary school teachers, they face very different conditions than university people, uh, even TAs and, and RAs. And, um, you know, the, the more of a turn to the left came out of the school teacher strikes than from the TAs and, and uh, what's happening in universities. Okay. I mean, fair enough. Uh, I mean, you, I, like if, if I remember correctly, the stuff that was happening in Wisconsin in 2011 to uh, in response to Walker was a function of that. And it was because they were, uh, I think it was like, a, it was over uh, largely over healthcare, I think too, but uh, yeah. regardless. Um, so, and, and so once that turn is made, it sort of, um, obscures this notion of 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 resignation as a response as to why workers are not uh organizing and that resignation is just like I, I i'm i'm damned if i do i'm damned if i don't type of situation and so i might as well just go with the path of least resistance yeah so the what if you if you were in a university in 1990 or 1995 what you would be told is that the way capitalism works is it's a system in which there's a lot of domination, a lot of people are being bossed around, but dominant classes, elites have hegemony, cultural hegemony. That's the, the, the buzzword that was used. And cultural hegemony basically means that because of their ideological indoctrination, because of their socialization, workers give a consent. They agree to their subordinate position in capitalism just the way inside the church, the laity agrees to give power to the priesthood, right? They do it because they're socialized into it. So the idea was capitalism runs on consent. And the consent comes from all this ideological stuff that they're told. And because of the dominant class controls media, they control all the, the political institutions, the universities, all that stuff. Now, this is what I'm challenging in my book, saying that the people aren't fools, they're not idiots. The reason they can they agree to stay where they are is because of the stuff that I just brought up earlier about the, the the dilemmas about coming together. So what they do is they don't consent to the system; they resign themselves to it. They, they kind of shrug and go, "Well, there's nothing I can do." As you said, there's nothing I can do. If I try to organize, I'll be fired. If I bring people together, together, we'll probably lose. And if we lose, we're fired again. So until and unless I think there's a real chance of winning, I'm just going to keep my head down. I'm going to try to make the best of this situation. And I'm going to just prioritize keeping my job. I'll do what I can. I might show up to work late. I might try to take more leave than I'm allowed to do. I might even sabotage the work process or you know, do something to throw, as they say, a wrench in the works while I'm at work. But taking the next step to organizing, that's too much. That means but, but I resign myself. D yeah. Does artificially creating, I mean, I, or you could say manufacturing that consent, right? Like, does that is that really a way to kind of ascribe a morality to a system artificially that is that uh, does not exist it gives it a sense of like oh you know that everybody here is playing by the rules and this is just how the chips fall is that how you can uh, maybe characterize it well that actually is more of a sense of resignation which is that look this is the way the world is and there's nothing much we can do about it and people do believe that that's a sign that they don't think they can change anything. And if you, if you poll American workers over the past 40 years, a lot of them would say that, would just say, if you ask them, hey, do you like your job? They'd say, no. You say, well, why don't you do something about it? Well, that's just the way the world is. That's the response you get. What the ideology tries to do is something more than that, which is not just to say, look, this is just the way the world is. It's 
you're told this is actually the best of all possible worlds. And if you want to see an ideology that does that, that's what libertarianism is. What libertarianism tells people is, look, you're free. You can get whatever job you want. You don't like your job, quit. You don't like your boss, get another one. You don't like being a worker, become a capitalist. That's the kind of legitimizing ideology that capitalists try to sell. And that's the image of consent. But the truth is most people on the bottom don't buy that. The people who buy that actually is the winners, is the people on top, is the, the professional classes, the employers. So the moralistic, legitimizing kind of way of looking at capitalism saying, this is actually a good system. That's the image that the intelligentsia had of, of what we're to believe in the 80s and 90s. And obviously it's false. That, I mean, the intelligentsia's understanding of what workers believe is wrong. Uh, so is, it, is there, I, I, I wanna ask if there is a third answer to this. Um, and then maybe this third answer is not actually a third answer, and, and it is you know, part of that sort of cultural turn. But if on one hand, the explanation is a certain false consciousness that they've been uh, that, that that workers have been ideologically indoctrinated to um, uh, to not see their own exploitation in this system, to um, uh, you know, and then all the morality that's built around yeah. it and this and that. And, and, and your argument is that there is a resignation that is a function of, of, of the sort of material circumstances that have created, which, which to me reminds me of black voters not supporting Barack Obama until he wins Iowa, uh, because uh, there was some sense of like, we're never going to get a black president. And so it, like, I, I'm not even going to invest in the idea that we could have a black president because I know that we can't, so I'm, um, you know, I'm not even going to uh, like imagine that. Yeah, it's what is happens. It to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, but, that, but is it possible that there's also a, a third answer, which is that for, and maybe this again, maybe maybe this is my not fully. Maybe this is actually a, a category error, and it's actually part of that first category. But but is it possible that there's a third answer insofar as, um, you know. I know the argument, uh, the that that your argument is that uh, what's the matter with Kansas is 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 wrong because it, it it is it takes this cultural turn. But what if there is not that this cultural ideology or identification is a distraction? But what if it is within humans? Maybe we're not all you know the same. That like once I get my three squared and my house over my head and i you know i'm not too concerned about how much of it is and uh you know i've been i've been I, i'm resigned to the idea that it's going to be somewhat stressful but after that the things that are important to me are actually not uh, are not material like once i have a basic material floor then i just move on to other things and it's not a distraction it's real it is re it's my real interest um and what is that where does that fall in, in, in those categories? Yeah, I think that's actually pretty accurate. I think that is how people think. And, but the question is, after the 1950s and such, is that the reason that you see labor movements become kind of meek and mild and started losing members and you see the labor movement turning away from its kind of radicalism that you found in the 20s and 30s? And for a long time, people thought, yes. See, one reason, so what, what you're describing, Sam, there was a philosopher in the 60s, he was big among the new left, his name was Herbert Marcuse. And the new left thought of him as their uh, philosopher in the 60s. SDS was all reading Marcuse and One Dimensional Man. Marcuse said this, look, what's happened is unions, and maybe this is what Emma meant earlier when she talked about um, are unions or is labor part of the legitimizing force? Unions won a lot of great contracts for their, for their members. Wages went up, working days were limited. They were able to have you know, the 1.5 cars and the 2.2 kids and whatever. And it, the idea was, okay, they've become satisfied. They're complacent. And that's why things have now settled down as much as they have in say 1958 and 1964. Now, if all that capitalism, the, if the only way it harmed employees was by suppressing their wages. Then having higher wages, like you're saying, 
would solve a lot of problems for capitalists and for capitalism. But the employment relation, having a job, harms a worker in many other ways than just suppressing their wages. And this came, people realized this in around 1967, 68, 69, when in the midst of having the highest wages they'd had in the 20th century, workers all over Western Europe and in the United States went on a strike wave like they'd never seen since the 30s. The question is, why did that happen? Their wages were really high. They had the cars, they had the houses. It was because there's another side of the job, which is how fast are you having to work? What are the safety conditions? How much recourse do you have to have your boss listen to you if you say there's something dangerous going on? What they found was that in the 60s, 50s, and 60s, wages went up, but there was a huge speed up at work. Injuries were going up, and the unions weren't paying attention to the grievances. Work days were getting longer. The unions weren't doing anything about it. So even while you're getting the car and the house, you can be harmed in a hundred other ways of the job because what the bosses try to do is not only to suppress your wages, but to get the most work out of you, the most labor out of you, to have the most flexible schedule for them, which means an inflexible schedule for you. All of these things mean, uh, bring, come together in the employment contract. And the secret to capitalism is you've never been able to solve all of them together. You can push on in one direction, you can solve some of them, but what employers do is get back through a different channel what they give up through one channel. If the workday is shortened, they increase the pace of work. If the wages go up, they increase the intensity of work. So it's, there's never a time when workers actually experience this image of a settled life, of a decent life, the way that's sold to them. And that's why there's no time when the actual antagonism between employer and employee ever comes to an end. Did the um, increase in pay, does that, uh, and, and then the, the increase in pay and the subsequent uh, or uh, contemporaneous sort of uh, uh, diminishing sort of work standards, I guess, yeah. does that play into your idea of how you deal with resignation? In yeah, other words, does, does. okay, all right, will you, will you, will you talk about that, uh, about, about how, um, I, I guess, like, some, some sense of security that may come with more cash um, yeah. get, puts you in a position to feel more empowered uh, in terms of demanding more? Yeah, so look, if it's the case, simple, simple question, if today we're we're all part of an effort to try to revitalize the left and revitalize the labor movement. The question is, how do, how do you go about doing it? You need a diagnosis for why strikes and strike activity is flatlined for 30 years in this country. Okay, if your explanation is, well, it's because of culture and ideology, you ask the question, well, why are they duped so easily? And you figure out, you wag your finger at them and you tell them, don't you see what we see? Don't you see that things are bad for you, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you believe that that's not the reason, and the reason is that it's the crushing weight of the, the costs of organizing, then you do what you just said, Sam, which is you try to reduce all the risks and all the costs that they have to take. So two models of organizing. One is you go into a workplace and you moralize the people versus you go into the workplace and you pour resources into it as a kind of a risk reduction scheme for them. You tell them, hey, if we go out on strike, there's gonna be a strike fund. You tell them, look, if the employer fires you for organizing, we've got a whole team of lawyers that's gonna come in and make sure that you're protected, et cetera, et cetera. It's increasing the security of the job action and so decreasing the risk. And then finally, you've gotta show that whatever goals you have, whatever you're fighting for in this fight is achievable. And it's not just a pipe dream that some, you know, somebody from a union office has come up with. We can actually win this. And you show them that you've got an effective strategy for winning it. This is all treating people like rational thinking people rather than as being dupes. And that's the strategy that the left employed for a hundred and some years until all of this thinking about organizing and capital, et cetera, was taken over by people who are not actually in those movements and in those struggles, which is people like me. If, um, if it's the case that you need to go in on a case-by-case, shop-by-shop -case, uh, uh, level and make the argument of, you know, uh, we got your back covered here, this is an attainable goal, um, 
that it is a rational decision to make. Uh, there's there's risk involved, but it's it's not an irrational risk. And there is is that and and uh, you know is that also an argument from a uh, a legislative perspective? Let's say from a more like a twenty thousand uh, foot view for some measure of incrementalism, right? Because if if I get the pro act passed, let's say right. or card check, uh, I mean I do sort of non-revolutionary but minor um uh strengthening of the ability of people on the ground to organize or you know uh that that at one point theoretically or you tell me if you agree with this premise that at one point theoretically you're gonna the straw is going to be the the, the one straw that ends up being pushing over and creating like a critical mass if you will in terms of my perception that this is actually not a bad risk to take. Absolutely. That is the only way to go. What is the PRO Act going to do? What does legislation do? It changes, you might say, the facts on the ground. It, it changes the power balance because now, with if, for example, car check legislation is passed, now I don't have to stick my neck out as much as I did previously to try to organize, which means my employer's got less power over me. If I have enforceable rights against being fired, which in the US today, they're, they're, they're a joke. You, you can fire an, organ, an employee for organizing. It's basically unenforceable that the employer got punished. Say you can enforce it. Now it's changed the risk calculus for me. So absolutely, the legislative process is part of that whole organizing drive that you're doing. And you have to burn that candle on both ends, as it were. You've got to do the organizing and do the legislation. Where we are right now, actually, in the American left is we're aware of the legislative stuff. Everybody's pushing for that. The problem is there's no real power in the economy. There's no real power that the labor movement traditionally gave to parties so that politicians would feel like they've got to pass something meaningful. And instead, what you get is now, like the Biden administration crashing and burning, because you can, it's, it's a big deal that a progressive legislation was even proposed. I mean, something like what we saw in BBB was not even possible five or eight years ago. It's a big deal. Yep. Why does it crash and burn? It's not just because of Manchin and cinema. They just happen to be the front runners on this thing. There's a whole slew of senators, Congress people behind them, because there's no cost to saying no. There's no cost to, to trashing this legislation for the politicians because there's no movement on the ground to help them, to force them to do it. There is a cost to passing it, which is all of their funders are going to get, you know, obviously be very unhappy about that. So the legislative side that you brought up is not controversial right now on the American left. What we need to get more serious about is to try to get some power within workplaces, which traditionally was the real leverage, what gave parties the leverage to pass things like the New Deal. I mean, it, it, there is a sort of like a, a, a chicken and egg syndrome here, right? I mean, where um, we have, uh, you know, Taft Hartley, uh, I think, you know, still which resonates and, and makes it that much harder uh, to develop that type of, of movement on the ground. I mean, look, we saw the biggest protests that we've seen uh, in in decades probably over the course of 2020 and there was no there was no well there's certainly from a federal standpoint there was no uh legislation passed um and even you know in sort of localized things it, it wasn't there um yeah. and uh and and so and 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 those theoretically came with even less potential risk than you might have if you do that in your workplace insofar as that like there was not a one-to-one -one relationship with go protesting during 2020 about uh police reform uh to you your you know your ability to get fired or something like that from from your employer so where do where where is the intervention that is going to um you know, let me put it this way is there an intervention that can happen on a grander scale or is it really just up to like you know, you're listening to this program, go into your uh, workplace and uh, and organize by addressing or if you're, you know, uh, working with the union or any type of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a 
group that's outside of that go into these workplaces and address all the 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 things that are on the the sort of the the the, the balance of the scale that say like this is a bad idea <laughs> right like, you know like start addressing those things but is there something that sort of can happen more broadly do we not have the power or is it just sort of like tinier pieces of legislation or is it like uh, uh bank shots right. like you know if we had a better uh, system of healthcare if we had a single payer healthcare system i'm at work and if i lose my job at least i'm going to still have healthcare Right. Well, let me start by making a basic distinction here that is relevant to your first question about the massive protests and like Black Lives Matter and all that. There's a big difference between protest and disruption. Protests, it's pretty easy to ignore them if you're in the elites, because what's a protest is a symbolic act. People come out on the streets, they very loudly announce that they're unhappy about something and they might even rattle some drums and things like that, but then they go home. Nothing has changed. What it's it's basically like delivering a letter, but it's a lot of people delivering a letter. That's different from labor organizing. Labor organizing wasn't ever a protest. Labor organizing what mattered because it has the potential of disrupting the everyday flow of events in a way that no other, neither protest nor other dis disruption can. And the reason is, what labor disrupts is the flow of profits. And everything in capitalist society runs on revenues coming out of profits, either in taxes or corporate uh, revenues coming out of it, government revenues, everything comes out of that, that what is happening in, in productive establishments. So what labor organizing does is it brings people together. And if they're together in a large labor movement, they are holding a gun to the head of the system day in and day out in a way that no protest can. Because they're saying, not only there's, are they saying we could come out on the streets in large numbers at any moment. Yeah, that, okay, that's great if you can do it, but that's not the key. It's that we can shut down the economy at any moment. That's what gets the attention of politicians. That's what gets the government to listen. Now, that is still in its infancy right now. There's lots of protests going on, but there's not much organizing going on. The second part of your question was, okay, how then do you organize? There's no science to this. Yeah, it's going to come through some combination of legislative activity, what you said about the minor, small organizing efforts in workplaces. And, and then, if it's going to work, it has to come together through some process that we don't understand, we've never been able to understand, or we could do it, we would just do it, right? Some process where these things come together into something big, where there is not just a strike here and there, but a wave of strikes not just organizing this or that Starbucks and this or that Amazon, but across the board. And that's what we saw on the 30s, forget the revolutions, just in the New Deal we saw that. That's what we saw in the 60s, in the second great, exp great expansion of welfare states. That's what we have not seen in 40 years. It's gotta go beyond protest. Protest is not what changed, protest is a part of a cultural shift. Ruling classes can ignore cultural shifts. What they're worried about is at the end of the day, not getting elected, not making profits, not being able to serve their masters, which is the corporate class. That's what gets their attention. It's it's basically the withholding of labor is going to, um, it's like uh, draining the car of fuel on some level. As and long as you're in capitalism, it comes down. As long as we're in capitalism, that's what it's going to come down to. Um, it's uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, Vivek Chibber, professor of sociology at New York University, author of The Class Matrix, Social Theory After... The cultural turn. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, we're going to head into the fun half of the program, wherein we will have all sorts of fun. We will have fun today. I think there's a lot of funny clips. Oh, geez. Yeah. We've got a couple doozies. A Matt couple of really doozies. Really came through with some. Uh, some fines today. You know what I got to say, and I'm just going to tease this. I'm not going to tell what it is, but Dave Rubin, uh, we have a clip of. Now, look, I, I, I don't think Dave Rubin is um, as an important of a target. I don't think the targeting of him is as important as it used to be, because I think it's it's quite clear, yeah. you know, um, you know where he is on the spectrum. He was pretending to be something. I think he was sort of uh, funneling people into yes. a, um, a perspective. But what's fascinating about this clip 
is it includes many of the themes that we talked about uh, today with uh, Vivek Chibber. It is uh, cultural in that it is an attempt to provide a, um, uh, you know, uh, comedy. Yeah. And it is also a question of withholding labor because it is one of the laziest things I have ever seen anyone try and do in comedy. Um, and it is both, <laughs> he, it, it's almost as if he was striking against himself. Yeah. He's being, yeah. Right. I mean, sort of he, an internal protest that right, manifests itself right. publicly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like if, if, if he could both separate himself as both worker and, and actually boss, he as boss would be hara very panicked it's a, it's like what a, was going on. a one man play on yeah. uh, a one man capitalist critique play. Yeah. We yep. could say that, yep. right? Yep. I think it's one of the most uh, conceptual things he's ever done. Right. Uh, but we will uh, we will get to and that. And it's laziness. It, 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 and yes. Yeah. There's so many contradictions. So many. Uh, we will uh, we will get to that and more. Folks, it is your support that makes the show possible. Uh, when you become a member of the Majority Report, you get the free show free of commercials and you get the uh, fun half and you 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 uh, make this show survive and thrive. Uh, so become a member today at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, what do you do? Oh, wait, you can't. Yeah. No, it's already sold out. It's been sold out for weeks. Um, but Boston. Boston is not sold out. Don't do not sleep on Boston, folks. Because, um, you know, like it's taken, it's taken me a while to sort of figure out like what I should be doing at these shows. Like, you know, like I, we, we don't do many live shows and it's, it's usually because I just like, it is hard for me to sort of figure out like, how do I distinguish the, this show from the show that we do every day? You want it to be special. Mm -hmm. I put a little bit too much pressure on myself for these things, I think. It, yeah, I think it's kind of the form that makes it special more than the content. Yes, but I can't, like, I spent 15 years of my life doing live shows every, well, I mean, sketch shows were, you know, like it was on a weekly basis, but I would go up and do stand-up and this and that. And so, like, I the the, the stakes from, uh, for me on this are higher than they probably should be. But I sort of feel like I have a sense now uh, of of what it is. And there's... There's going to be like two types of shows, I think, for the live shows, assuming we do more of these. They're, um, and they're going to have elements of both, but, uh, you know, deal with the locality that you're at mm -hmm. or get someone uh, as a guest who is like so universal that it makes it special that they're there. And I feel like, Brooklyn is going to be sort of more local. Of course, you know, we're going to have the whole crew here too. So it's like in our backyard. Yeah. Boston. We got a special guest that is like, it's a, it's a good guest. It's a big, it's a big guest. Feels like, an, like, like a blimp. Like you don't see a blimp that often. It's a big deal, right? You go out, you see a blimp. It's like, Oh my God, look at the blimp. I can't remember the last like, time grown, I've seen a blimp. I'm a grown man. But when I see a blimp, I'm like, whoa, hey, you know, look at the blimp. Right. Right. I don't know what to tell Would you. Would this guest uh, appreciate being compared to a blimp? Probably not. Yeah. Like being compared to a toad or something. No one wants that. No, toads are more banal. Okay. I don't know. I've I've had I've been excited about toads before. But I like you... toads, but I just mean like if you're compared to one, you know, a blimp is big. Toads considered ugly. I, I'm talking the symbolism. Yeah, of I, the get experience I get it. I get it. A blimp. Right, but oh, I just have to God. undercut you in some way. It's God. more fun. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> folks, um, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Um, Matt, speaking of blimps. What's on in the uh, Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be uh, without David Griscom tonight on Left Reckoning. Just I'll, like a blimp. Yeah, I'll be solo. Solo. You never see blimps Floating in tandem. Through the air. Um, uh, yeah, just like a solo blimp. It won't be like the Hindenburg, though. Um, I... <laughs> <laughs> see? The blimp thing really works. Yeah. Yeah, it super works when the Hindenburg is the most readily uh, apparent one. Anyway, uh, I think Goodyear blimp is also pretty popular. 
Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carl Bear, we've been talking about ideology and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We're talking about do somethingism. We also been talking about tankies and all sorts of things in between. Also, in the post game, Gene Bajlan will join me to uh, get a little bit of industrial or in, uh, international relations. Um, I might ask him some industrial questions as well. So we'll see what happens. Patreon.com slash left And I'm also going to do a little bit of a history lesson on AC Townley, the uh, organizer who started the Nonpartisan League which realized that both uh, third parties are screwed um, in America, so you need to organize on ballots that um, you can get on. But the parties themselves aren't to be trusted, so you need to start your own uh, independent power base. And they passed the uh, state bank and the state uh, state grain elevator. So I'll be going through that history tonight at 8 Eastern patreoncom slash left reckoning. And we'll also, in the fun half, going to be uh, getting into this whole uh, daylight savings thing. A lot of controversy. A lot and of controversy. This evolution thing. Oh yeah, oh jeez. Why? Why are we? Uh, why Wait, do people you... hate daylight, daylight savings? I'm tired. Yeah, it's because of daylight savings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know it's this sort of screwed as everybody. This everybody. is my coffee, and I'm like not really even halfway through it yet. So that's the issue. See you in the fun half. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Matt! Yo. Fun hack. What is up, everyone? Fun hack. No me key. You did it! Fun hack. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hack. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women. Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Uh, Yes. Yes. Is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? No sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. I'm gonna go start off. Who libertarians? They're so stupid though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him! So what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I wanna say. 857 210 35 501 one half. 38. 911 for instance. $3,400. $1,900. Five, four, dollars trillion sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. Of but, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. <laughs> Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks. 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 It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah. Sun's out, guns out. I, I I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. Anyway. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, this, Look, um, gotta jump. I gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. <laughs> um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. Woo. <laughs> I just made it back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. It is the fun half. That's what that bell means. It means the fun half is happening and the voicemail gets turned off. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, there are uh, some key Senate races that are happening around the country. 
Um, <laughs> one of those states is Ohio, where uh, the two uh, leaders in uh, the Ohio race in the Republican primary are uh, uh, Josh Mandel, a lunatic, and this guy, uh, Gibbon. Steve Gibbon, is it? Mike Gibbon, uh, who has now just come out that he had some racist uh, statements to make uh, about Asian people. Um, not sure if that helps or hinders in the uh, Republican primary. And of course, um, uh, J.D. Vance um, seems to have like uh, been swept away. So uh, interesting in that. But let us turn our attention to a different um, key senatorial race. And that is taking place in Georgia. The candidate for the Republicans, uh, now there's going to be a primary, right? Um, uh, but, right. They, they, but, but Trump has uh, thrown his support behind this candidate, I believe. For whatever that's worth, has thrown his support behind the uh, former uh, football player. Where did he play? Uh, Hershel Walker played, he played for, for the Vikings. Vikings. And also, didn't he play for like, was he at? Not the Browns. Well, he played for in college for uh, UGA, right? Yeah. Um, and Wait, I want to say like the Oilers. Well, he did play remember. for the Giants, unfortunately for me, um, and the Eagles. He and was Eagles. previously known for like being on and the, the, um, the the wrong part of a trade that was notorious boondoggle that um, sent a bunch of valuable players to the Cowboys. Okay. And so uh, Herschel Walker. Now, I think we should probably start with the other clip first and go with this one second. Um, Herschel Walker has, uh, there's two video clips we have of Herschel Walker to give you a sense. The first is, is that, um, and I don't know, I imagine people in Georgia were aware of this, but it turns out this guy is, um, he could theoretically be one of the most theocratic members of the Senate, I think, mm -hmm. um, based upon what he's saying here. Also, not one of the sharpest tacks in the Senate. Although, to be fair, Ron Johnson is in the Senate. They may serve contemporaneously, hopefully not. So he wouldn't be the stupidest. Yeah, I mean, football's not sending their best. Also yes, Tuberville, Tuberville right. Yeah, he's that, Tuberville, he's yeah. the dumbest one. Yeah. He's the dumbest one. But uh, Until potentially But, Herschel you know, Walker. to be fair to Herschel Walker, this is more about being a, uh, a theocrat and a fundamentalist than it is necessarily not being that sharp. So somebody had a story, let there be light because something had to be created here. Come on. So when the light was created here, that means somebody up there had to say, let there be light that the earth started. And then he had to put someone there on earth. Because remember, Adam was there. Remember, Adam came there, then Eve came. Remember. So somebody <laughs> had to start it out. So that means it had to be a God. So it didn't just, uh, some bomb blew up and it started out. And then I, I tell you something else I heard, and I think about this, because at one time, science said man came from apes. Did it not? I've read, That's when you, know, you go I, to the every science. Time, every time I read or hear that, I think to myself, you just didn't read the same Bible I did. Well, what, All right, pause it for one second, because I want to I go back, because he doesn't know where uh, Herschel's going with this. And uh, Although, Pastor Chuck Allen, that is uh, an accurate assessment. The scientists who uh, talk about evolution did not read the same Bible that you did. Or maybe well, they read it, uh, but they, they have a different interpretation or of no, its meaning. Or, or yeah, I mean, they, they could have read the same Bible and said, okay, this is a nice story. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice story, and uh, I can see the value. I think we still have work to do scientifically, humans, though. But <laughs> to, if we really want to look at— like, open and shut case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for delivering the Bible. I mean, it's also just sort of weird, like, if you really did think the Bible is sort of definitive, like, why did it take so long to write? Like, like I mean, like, why didn't, why, what, however many thousands of years it was, I guess it was, uh, according to the creationists, about 4,000 years, right, is when we got, uh, it was like, uh, or 2,000, well, no, 6,000, the earth is 6,000 years old. Okay. And we got the Bible somewhere, I think, uh, you know, uh, according to them, it would have been um, it would have been like in the year uh, 2000 BCE, I think. I think according to them, I'm not sure. Like, why did it take so many years? They were too busy procreating. They well, had to create Adam and his descendants and Eve. They had to create life on Earth. They were just banging their brains Let me ask you this. Years. I'm going to create light for Earth. Okay. Or and on you're one a guy. On so one day. Can. Yeah. On one day. Or I'm going to be like, eh. Uh, these animals on this day, all these animals, a lot of them. 
I can't write one book. I can't make one book. Seriously? That doesn't make any sense at all. But okay, let's go. Did it not? I've, That's I, when you, know, you go I, to the every, every time I read or hear that, I think to myself, you just didn't read the same Bible I did. Well, what, this was interesting, <laughs> though. If that is true, why are there still apes? Think about it. You know, now you're getting too smart for it. No, 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 no. Sure. Think about this. We have an evolution that is we've gotten so intelligent that if that is true, why are there still apes? And then the conception of a baby. Let me tell you. <laughs> no way. I, 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 I want. I want to keep I going. Hear. I want to keep going. But but I, I I I sort of feel like do do we need to tell people why they're still apes? Like. I don't like maybe Herschel should have spent just like four more minutes engaging with the idea that we um, evolved from apes because it's not. And I said this to Matt earlier. I said, that, you know, that that picture they have, the graphic of like the ape, 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 right. ape, and then man. And Walking that, that up, right? Yeah. That seems to be the extent in which Herschel Walker has in, engaged with the concept of evolution. And, and it is a little bit misinforming because it's only it's two dimensional. And, and really what happened is like, you know, human evo evolved from that ape, but so didn't other apes right. <laughs> and other things. It's like a tree. It's sort of like saying, if uh, you're saying chihuahuas are real, why are there golden retrievers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chihuahua's a dog and Golden Retriever's a dog? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> that seems a little suspect, doesn't it? But let's keep going on because he really, uh, he's bringing it home here. The science can't do that. They're still on. trying to do it, Come on. but it can't because there had to be a God. So when God came and said, now, let me create this, and God created the earth, and he put Adam and Eve there and stuff, and then this what was so funny. This is what makes it even better. Even in that little garden, he said, uh, from this place, you got all the freedom, just like you got it in the United States. You got all the freedom, do whatever you want to do. But then he said, nah, don't mess with that tree over there because you mess with that tree, you will surely die. So you had rules and regulations, just like we got it in the United States of America, oh, got rules that? and regulations. And it, when you break the rules, you will surely die. Same thing we got here. If you don't do what's right, you surely go to jail or you need to be punished. Like I said, I got a spanking. And I said, that's the reason why I said, guys, this is a great country. This is a country Spanking. where we all can have all different religion. And I tell people- Hold on, for pause it for one second. Bye, bye. Who is going to be the first person to tell Herschel Walker that there are in fact rules in other countries? In fact, there are rules in other countries where if you break them, you do die. But they don't have the, they don't <laughs> like, have the freedom that they have here plus the rules and regulations. That's what makes a special sauce. No, no, they have the freedom no. to go and break the rules. No, 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 they don't have the freedom that uh, the the that Adam and Eve have. That is what the United States, that's what's unique to the United also, States. Also, Adam and Eve had the garden even before they bit the apple. But, Wait, but, well, the, but, but, but you guys are missing the point here. He is actually running for senator in a place like Iran or Saudi Arabia, where when you do break those rules, a lot of times it will end in death. Or a spanking for him. Or, or a spanking from his dad. But but the idea that like that's what makes America great is that we have rules and freedom to break those rules. That's just about everywhere. Except yeah. for the death part, although I, you, you may want to bring that back yeah. more. But all right, let's continue because he's going to explain uh, that America is is great. And it's okay if you have a different God than Jesus, even though it's not a real God and you're kidding yourself and you're going to pay for it. Country where we all can have all different religion. And I tell people this, I'm not trying to teach you to love Jesus. I love him. You can like who we want to like, but I'm going to tell you, there's only one of them. That's right. There's only one God. There's only one Jesus. So if you're going with the wrong horse, I'm, I'm sorry for you. I'm telling you, I love Jesus. And I tell people this, guys, Jesus lives within me. Amen. And I can't do nothing without the power of Jesus. Right. And I said, it's going to be tough. Sometimes sometime I, I ask God, where are you at? But it is sort of like this. I'll tell you this. Okay. So right, we've had enough. I mean, this is, uh, I, I, honestly, I encourage people to watch the whole thing so that you can get terrified. Um, but, but it's, look, yeah. we've learned something. And that is 
Jesus is God and also a horse. Mm. He's also a horse. He's all thing, all living, beautiful things. No, just a horse. He's a sea, he's sea biscuit. He's a horse. Don't, he he don't. would be sea biscuit. And that's be what, any horse. When he's asking uh, God, he's also Harambe. when he says, where's God? God is probably out in the pasture. Pretty bold eating, of Herschel Walker grass. to to come out in favor of, of rules and regulations in the Republican yeah. primary, right? I don't think, yeah. Why well, think... is he? He's going to run on. Uh, um, I love OSHA, right? F FDA. Let's more more of that. Now look, the uh, there seems to be a, a significant. I mean, I don't. I'm not quite sure I understand. What, like, what's going on? This is Nikki Haley, right? Yeah. Nikki Haley uh, joined Herschel Walker, mm -hmm. and. Um, Nikki Haley, of course, is from South Carolina. Uh, Herschel Walker is uh, running in Georgia. And I wonder if, like, I, like why Nikki Haley? Like, what, like, what is going on? Like, wh like, why did Nikki Haley do this? It's a way to ingratiate herself to Trump, right? Yeah. This is a big uh, part of it. But why do they want Nikki Haley uh, to do this? Like, what? I don't, I don't, I mean, maybe that she has a good, uh, Q rating in Georgia. Um, but this is one of the most uncomfortable and bizarre sort of videos out there to raise money for Herschel Walker. That is, uh, that one could imagine. All right, Herschel, what do you got to do? Win. How are you going to do it? <laughs> Score touchdown. And what do you need? A quarterback. No money. Everybody, Herschel Walker, we got to get him over the finish line. Five, ten, twenty-five dollars today. Let's get Herschel Walker in the. <laughs> so he gets it wrong twice. So well, the joke is he's a, joke. a dumb guy. It's a joke is he's a dumb guy. Like, oh, come on, say goodbye, Gracie. Goodbye, Gracie. No, but the other part is like also like, did the did did they did they just meet like outside of a restroom and decide to shoot this because. Why is she using a different metaphor? <laughs> got to score a touchdown. That's right. We've got to get him across the finish line. Wait, what? <laughs> Wouldn't you have said, like, let's get Herschel into the end zone? If, like, like, honestly, I think this was just like, oh, my God, Herschel Walker. Oh, my God, lady from the TV. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> let's shoot a commercial to raise you some money. Okay. And, like this is can we watch that again they're, they're going for like a buddy cop vibe maybe right like she doesn't get football is that supposed to be part of it but he's the football player no well, i think it's more like uh abbott and costello and except for the guy that we're supposed to vote for is an idiot the dumb one. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> extremely all right herschel what do you gotta do win how do you do it? <laughs> well, and what do you need a quarterback no money. Everybody, Herschel Walker, we got to get him over the finish what? line. Five, ten, twenty-five dollars today. Let's get Herschel Walker in the Senate. Yeah, she just uh, she did doesn't what? know sports. Oh man, we got to hit the basketball into the end zone, and then we'll get five points. His reaction of like what he looks at the camera, looks back at her is well. This is this I'm is this so is probably also his son <laughs> saying, "Dad, you got to do social media. You got to do Instagram. You got to have fun doing it." This I think he, I think he's having fun. I don't know if she's having fun. I think they're both having fun. They're thinking like, "This is funny. <laughs> this is good stuff." I think this is really fun. No, I think Herschel, she she's in pain. Fun. She's this in pain. Fun. Look this at her face. Don't even go, go go back. Look at her face. That was she's not ha genuinely having fun. Oh, she. I'm telling you, she has had some type of. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe she was always uh, always this uh, craven. But I, su I suspect that there's like she's heavily medicated so that she can do all this stuff <laughs> and deal with Trump and all this. So I, she just she doesn't she wishes she could just be like an establishment Republican from the old days. She doesn't want to do this kind of crap. He needs a quarterback. Why is he dressed like he's from the 50s? I too? just want to play one more time his first look at the camera and yes. wonder what sort of direction he was given about this. Well, he saw her do it and then he did it. <laughs> all right, Herschel, what do you got to do? Win. How do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Oh god. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Hey. A little bit slow. Calling from a 510 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from?
You hear anybody? All right, five one zero. Try it again. Might just be them. Uh, let's take another caller and see if it is your fault or our fault. Call from a seven three two area code. Who's this? Harley from New Jersey. Harley from New Jersey. Thank you for showing us that five one zero has a real problem. <laughs> Couldn't get five one zero over the finish line. Oh my God! Uh, this is my first time calling in. I I've tried uh, several times. Okay, I have. Not okay. Um, first of all, Emma, <laughs> has uh, any of these callers uh, ever told you uh, what a cutie pie you are? Because you and Nomi are. Uh, okay. yeah, that's right. not appropriate. But go ahead. Okay, um, Sam. Uh, what would you say to uh, uh, someone who says uh, a society uh, is collapsing around us? Uh, uh, what would you say to counter that argument? Because I had that question asked to me uh, uh, recently. And my answer was, we're getting there. Okay, and you want a better answer than that? I can't believe you rebounded from yeah. <laughs> from that initial yeah. um, um, comment. I, anyway. I uh, so you agree with me? Well, look, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I am not. Uh, let me just say this: everyone has an ebb and flow of the way that they perceive how things are going in the world. I am not at the flow part. <laughs> I am more in the ebb thinking. Now, things can change very quickly, um, but it would be hard to argue that um, we're not still on a trajectory where things are going to be more difficult. But I will say this, there's, there's, it is always darkest before the dawn. And that's, that's I'm not the mm. first person to say that, and so uh, that so you know it's true. Good, uh, it's I mean it's also I mean it's probably also true that it's always darkest you know before like you know right at that moment when the lights are turned off. So, but take the first one is better. Um, I, I I think look there is a lot of things that are breaking down in society. And I think the best, um, the, the best answer I can give you is that it's going to present opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I could see that. All right. Um, well, I appreciate the call. Uh, bye. You sound like a cutie. Oh, uh, I have to go already. Yeah. I think like the thing is society is always or, or civilization or whatever humanity on earth is always in a state of collapse and rebirth. Like, I mean, where would you put the year? Like if it's back in reconstruction and that failing, for instance, it would probably right. look a lot like it would civilization. Look, it would look pretty bleak. Yeah. I mean, it would be hard not to walk around even after the civil war and say things aren't bleak. It would be hard not to go through parts of Europe and say things aren't bleak. Um, or the 1930s. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, but I do think, I, I, I do think that we are in for a protracted period of time in this, in American society, and probably others too. I, I'm not as sensitive to it, obviously, um, where it's, it, it, things are going to get a little bit worse before they get better. Yeah. And, but I, I honestly like, and I, you know, I've said this before, so it's not, but I, I really do think that like, we, there's a generational thing that has to change. And I think, you know, in terms of like good things happening here and I, I we, you know, I, I don't think we're too far off from that. Just, uh, you know, from a, you know, actuarial standpoint. Um, I also think that like, as, as, Matt said we're in a you know constant flow of uh collapse and rebirth or whatever you said but like there's also just in because we have access to all of this information all of the time always um via social media there's like a sense of uh anxiety around it that I think is unique to uh our era and specifically our generation in terms of how we consume it that makes things more heightened and may uh, allow us to lose some perspective. That doesn't mean that the suffering that human beings are facing 
now isn't atrocious it just means that like the way that we're perceiving it is unique and new um and the anxiety it's producing is probably more intense i think there's some truth to that but i also think it also could just mean that there's more people who are aware uh that we're in a uh, i don't think so up. like i genuinely think there is a unique mental state for our generation and younger that like a baseline level of anxiety that is solely a function of social media mm -hmm. I, I i mean i think that's true but uh, it's not i don't know that it means that the perception is wrong it just could mean that there are like uh, in other I'm not words saying it's wrong I, I'm, I'm saying that in other times where we have gone through crises like these there may not have been uh as many people who are aware of the breadth and the depth of the crises. There's more now uh, people because of social media and, uh, and yeah. the internet and whatnot, um, which, you, which I don't know from the perspective of the individual, I don't know if that's really any consolation. No, it's not. I just, I like, the point though, is that that baseline level of anxiety may cause people to have less of a perspective about the cyclical dynamic that Matt mentioned. Yes, I'm not sure I agree with that. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think- I think it's just like more people are aware. Like I have a feeling like those individuals who are like, oh Jesus, we could be headed into World War II or, or World War I were like freaking out. And um, it's just that we have more of those people now because they have, there's more people with that level of insight to world events. Like if this was happening, if what was going on in Russia and Ukraine right now was happening 50 years ago, let's say, pre, you know, sort of a cable news, you'd have one, one newscast that you would see a day and um, uh, Walter Cronkite would come on and go, you get like a three minute uh, clip of like, there's a war, you know, Russia has invaded uh, Ukraine. And uh, here is a 30 second clip of a, that includes, you know, black and white footage of, uh, and that's. Yeah, you could old like British um, uh, newsreels of like the uh, overthrow of Mossadegh or something like that. And how much attention was what, given to that. So, oh, what, anyway, yeah, yeah. Here's the soccer. But what are you, what are you oh. saying that contradicts what I'm saying? There were people who were like, oh shit, this is bad. Uh, but there just wasn't that many of them. And so I'm not saying that it, it changes. Nothing you're saying is contradicting what I said. You're, I, I, I took what you said is that the number of people who are aware of it was, was giving them a, a warped perception of the implications of this. And I'm saying, I don't think the, uh, there's, a, there's a warped perception of the implications. I just think that there's more people who are aware of the actual implications. I, I, and that, and that was what I was, at, at least in part, trying to convey. And maybe that we're just not sort of psychically prepared to how to yes. deal with the implications yes, of that. Yes, thank you. Yes. I don't know that anybody is in any time. It's just well, that's more why, of us who, right. who don't know. But there, that, like, I mean, that, I think that there's a reason, though, that 30 and younger, because of that increased access, had the, the, it increases like levels of existential dread and anxiety and depression. I think that that's a hundred percent that true. dynamic. Yeah. Although to kind of bring it back to what Chibber said, I think if all those folks were able to have uh, just be focused on starting families a little bit more often and like investing in properties yeah. and stuff like that, that they probably, um, I, I think there's some truth that they wouldn't be. And Charlie Kirk is actually, this is why he's saying the government should intervene and like start getting people into housing because I think there's on the right they understand some of that stuff mm. that it's it's counter revolutionary actually yeah not just social media says Sam from Ottawa every generation is going to have more and more access to information they know how how bad it's been where it's gotten and where it could should be the doomerism today is comparable to Cold War times and it's just going to get worse as we enter another cold climate war. Uh, Colin from 510. And uh, hello? Uh, 510. Yes, we can hear you. Stoon also says oh. it's not true that it's darkest before the dawn. The sky actually begins lightning a good hour before dawn. Mm, okay. Well, but that's the dawn. Uh, hey, yeah. hey, Sam. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Hmm. I'm doing good. Uh, Who's I this? Just, I called because uh, it was actually a couple of days ago. When Who's, you had that, uh, who are this? you? Oh, uh, my name is Arash. That's nature. 
Arash, nice to meet, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, I'm just calling because like a couple of days ago, you had this video uh, where you talked to uh, an individual regarding uh, a specific uh, study. It was the uh, SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccinated study. Um, and the only reason I wanted to call was because I've actually, uh, I come from like a medical family, right? So yeah. we kind of debate this type of thing o over dinner. Yeah. So uh, uh, one, one of the things, like I actually had like a whole Google Doc that I had made on this exact thing, right? Um, so let, let me just to be that, clear, just to be clear, you're talking about a phone call I got from a uh, Joe Rogan fan, I think it was, right? Was this the guy? Uh, I'm trying yeah, to remember the, that call. And it was, yeah. uh, he was saying like, I, I'm not going to cite something that's the whole point <laughs> right okay yeah that guy okay. uh so uh, i just when i saw that i knew exactly the study he was referencing and i knew that there was uh, enormous problems with it right um like just beyond the fact that it was a preprint you know as not pre review it right and it wasn't even the age group he initially referenced yes. right there was like some major problems with it for example the two numbers compared which was uh, events per 1 million vaccines and events uh, per 1 million children per 120, they entail different denominators, right? So once, but once those denominators are equalized and then compared, then the rate becomes 37 CAEs per 120 days, which is actually lower than um, the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the cardiac. Uh, uh, okay, you know, was, let me, my, let me, my, let me just, uh, okay, okay. So he, we, we were arguing over whether there was a higher incidence of myocarditis um, from the vaccine versus a uh, higher incidence of myocarditis from uh, COVID. And Correct. the other thing we were arguing was, what is myocarditis? Like, how serious is it? And he contended that everyone who got myocarditis needed to go into the hospital. Um, and my contention was, it's actually far more banal than that, and you need to rest uh, for a couple of days, but by rest, I mean like, don't go jogging. Don't, you know, don't exert yourself too much. Um, yeah. You are, and, and we can actually, you are saying we can that those, both of them. You, you said, uh, and, and your argument is that the, the studies were comparing apples and oranges because the denominators on these things were not uh, lined up. And um, I, you, that, that makes sense to me. I haven't looked uh, specifically at that, but all right, go ahead, continue. Sure. We can address both of them, right? For example, the, the conversation about the severity of myocarditis with the vaccine versus without, you were actually correct. Like preliminary evidence has indicated that you know clinical courses of uh, vaccine-associated myocarditis, myocarditis is actually uh, mild in comparison to uh, 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 COVID-related hospitalization. So you were actually correct there. He's actually incorrect regarding the severity aspect of it, right? Um, and and the second point that you guys disagreed with, which is like uh, uh, whether or not there was um, a greater risk of myocarditis uh, uh, with vaccine versus with, versus with COVID, right? Um, and the study that he referenced, it seemingly uh, 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 backs the statement, right? But, uh, uh, but like, like people who looked at it, who analyzed the study, they realized that the, that the denominators were, uh, 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 for the two numbers being compared weren't actually the same, which is really problem problematic. And once you like, equalize those denominators, it actually indicates that uh, 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 that uh, you're more likely to get uh, myocarditis post COVID than you are post vaccination. Okay, right? and so but, um, and just to be clear, the, to explain this to people, the denominator in this instance would be like the pool of people who um, are either studied or are of a certain class that you're studying, right? So it could be like the pool of people would be all the vaccinations in the world, or it could be uh, a subset of those who are studied versus all the people who get COVID or all the people in the world who have the potential to get COVID or the group of people who got COVID who are, we study. So what do you, do you recall what those two denominators were, were uh, representing? Yeah, it, it was, so, so it was events per 1 million vaccines and events per 1 million children per 120 days, right? Wait, and, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I'm sorry. Grew, say, say the second one uh, slowly. Sorry, uh, events per 1 million children per 120 days. Okay, right? per 120 um, days. Okay. Exactly. And uh, you kind of mentioned something, which I think is also really problematic and kind of a, a, like a big mistake on the part of the study, 
was that uh, they utilized uh, overly broad criteria, right? So when they were looking at uh, VARES, um, they, they had to, uh, in, in determining which, like what were the, like a uh, weather, blah. When they were looking at VARES and they were uh, examining and trying to determine how many people had myocarditis post-vaccination, they included as one of the search criteria at basically any troponin positive case. But, it, but anyone actually involved with you know, clinical diagnosis knows that just because you're troponin positive doesn't actually mean you have myocarditis, right? You have to do like you know, uh, 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 cardiac imagery in order to determine it because there's uh, other things it could be, right? So the, the criteria they used for establishing someone had myocarditis post-vaccination was far too broad because it included troponin and positive, mm. right? And to be um, clear, it's not like VARES has this, uh, uh, you know, this check mark. Right. Do you have myocarditis? And the yeah. people inputting it, anybody can input into VARES is my understanding. And what? I'm not necessarily able to know whether I had myocarditis. Yeah, 100%. But like, let's just assume, let's just assume every single one of, of what was being pro like uh, uh, provided, right? Was like we, we have a report, right? Um, uh, uh, the, even if we assume that what they're saying is accurate, right? Uh, all that this that the study he provided would indicate is the likelihood of experiencing a post-vaccination report of myocarditis, not an actual instance of it, right. right? So the numbers that they're using is just it's it, it utilizes overly broad criteria, and all you're able to, de to determine is a report rather than an actual instance. And then even if we assume that the numbers they gave us were accurate, once you equalize the denominators, it still doesn't agree with what he said. So this is a problem that I have with people who talk about studies that they don't actually read or they don't actually look at what scientists are talking about on the subject. It's, or, it's, uh, frankly, exceedingly frustrating. with all due respect to the, to the caller that we had in, without the sufficient background and um, education to understand what the study says. Because, and frankly, and I would include myself in that. Like, I don't, I, I wouldn't have been like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> These denominators are not the same. One is uh, one in a million per 120 uh, days and right. the other one's not. Like, I'm still not clear on what the 120 days means. I can tell it is different and it's over the course of 120 days. I don't know which 120 days it is. Um, but I also am not aware that myocarditis um, that the that the the signifier that they were using for what constitutes myocarditis is actually too broad. I mean, basically, what you're saying is like, you know, this is um, yes, it's evident that there was a, a dog here because I can see dog hairs, but that doesn't mean that there was a um, there was a, uh, a golden retriever here. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, <laughs> see, <laughs> the, co the co comparison is a little tortured, but uh, I'll, I'll well, let it's it go. pretty tortured. It's pretty <laughs> tortured. All right. Well, I yeah, appreciate but, the phone call. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, um, uh, I, I think, like, you know, it, it, and look, I, I don't know if what you're saying um, is um, necessarily more accurate than what the other guy was saying, but it seems like you are capable of engaging in the topic in a way that he would not. And I say, cite something. He goes, Pff. he starts to lose confidence in his medical expertise. Mm. Yeah, I mean, these are the same people that downplayed the idea that anybody under the age of 20 is even dying from COVID, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate uh, I, You seem to have done your own research. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would just say before I leave, uh, uh, everything that I'm referencing or everything that I said, it can be backed by like actual medical professionals. If you look at something like Pubpeer, right? What I'm saying is not particularly controversial. No, I, case, I, it, that. that's what it seems right. like. I mean, it's just the, the point is that, <clears throat> and we can hang up now, but... Um, I didn't see this debate, but Thanks like, for yeah, but, 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 um, the guy that called in is probably like, he doesn't, he needs a lot of proof to make his case because what he's saying runs contrary to medical professionals, Sam taking them at face value. Even if you don't have the requisite background in it, you don't have the same, uh, mountain to climb uh, as someone who's presenting contradictory data. Extraordinary claims require yes. extraordinary evidence. Much more succinctly and better put than what I just said. Yes. Alina Avi says the secret word of the day is golden retriever. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Th this is the moment that we've all been waiting for. This, 
I present this with some trepidation. Okay. Because I feel like we may be obligated to end the show forever after we play this clip. We have reached the pinnacle. <laughs> it's not it's going to get any better for the mockery portion of the show. Yes. Dave Rubin, who was at one time, and I think still fancies himself to be a comedian, I have all the respect in the world for former comedians who come in and become political commentators. Um, some of my best friends were former comedians and political commentators. Like, you know me. Like Someone, right, your, your best friend but, is but, you? Well, yeah, that makes sense. But also, uh, I worked with Al Franken. Ah. Al Franken, very successful uh, comedian, uh, then became a great political commentator, and then became a very actually uh, respected senator had to resign or chose to resign uh, because of some charges which uh, about inappropriate touching or mocking a, a woman on a USO tour. Um, but so I think there is grounds for people to do this. But Dave Rubin, not only is he a bad political commentator, he is also a bad comedian even if he's not a former comedian. I mean, aside from the fact, yes, I know, he had no success. That's not the issue. I know a lot of people who are very funny who have had no commercial success. Mm -hmm. um, but he is uniquely unfunny in this clip. He is... And in general, and, and we should just say, like, there, there's there's a an effort on the right wing to make their content comedic. Uh, Steven Crowder engages in some of this. To me, this appears like uh, Ruben is trying to get in on the Crowder energy. Yeah, somebody said to Dave, Dave, why don't you go back to your comedic roots and drop some comedy in? Yeah, like the last liberal thing, you've kind of uh, sucked that bone dry. Now, basically, let's let, you, you, could, you could get in on the Crowder game. You could Step do it. Tap that skill set. I have a prediction. Right. After you see this video, you can decide whether you agree with me or not. That if Dave Rubin continues to do comedy or attempt to, he will hire a writer. <laughs> Uh, here is Dave Rubin. I, 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 just, so just I, to set the scene, we come in on a clip of The View where uh, Anna Navarro and Whoopi Goldberg are talking about how Tulsi Gabbard needs to be investigated for being a Russian asset. And uh, Dave uses that as an opportunity for comedy. Um, and uh, yeah, we can Brace yourselves judge it based on for that. this historic clip exists on Twitter, and the fact that we're giving her oxygen is what makes her relevant, that we're talking about her on hot topics. But on the other hand, how do you not call out something that oh my is God. repeating mm -hmm. false Russian propaganda well, that has I, been brought down? They used to arrest people for doing stuff like this. If they thought you were uh, colluding with a Russian agent, if they thought you were putting out information or taking information <laughs> and handing over to Russia, yeah. they used to actually investigate stuff like this, and I guess now you know there seems to be no bars what are you two crazy bitches talking about what are you talking about you want to arrest people who are different than you politically tulsi gabbard she's a member of our military she's a former congresswoman a democrat you just don't like her so you want to arrest her you want to arrest tucker carlson the very dapper tucker carlson I, what are you saying? You you guys are nuts. <laughs> you're, you're just nuts. I only agreed to do this show because I thought that Whoopi, Whoopi was sane. She was good. Sister act. Sister act too. Anna's just nuts. I don't even know what she's doing here. The other one's a racist and, the, and the, there's the drunk one. I, what, what, is, what are we all doing here? <sighs> you people are everything that you've come to hate. You know that? <laughs> Uh, why am I here? Mm. I need a haircut. That's better. Pause, 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 pause it. <laughs> it's the second or third time I've watched that. And um, it, I, I, I am so mystified by that. Let's just be... <laughs> clear here and we're, we're gonna take it back to the beginning because we're gonna we're gonna let it run through the whole thing but i just want to like let, let me just uh, address the technical things first because this is the smallest thing in the world when you do this type of thing and uh, we all have done this 
for for decades, cut yourself into other shows um, who who are in this type of line of work. You you want to actually like there there is a when you're editing you want to like you, you cut from uh, mm -hmm. from uh, reaction shot of Whoopi. Yeah, a reaction shot. You want to do that, and you also want to take some of the audio, um, the the you know the room tone from the other one yeah. so that it so that matches so it doesn't look like you're so you like, can't hear the cut as well as see it. yeah i mean this is the type of thing that like back when i would do with two vcrs and cutting back and forth between two vcrs before we had digital um mm -hmm. uh, th that 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 it would sound like that but then the other thing you want to do is have a joke <laughs> and like and if you're doing i think he thinks this is satire what, 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 what is really confusing about this is that he's playing a drunk conservative. Well, no, he's, he's playing himself as a woman. He's this is a fantasy of if I could be a, a host on The View. Yeah, I think that's it's, right. I thought it was doing like a McCain impression, but he, he doesn't he reference her. And all like of that. this is just stuff he already says. But why would you do McCain impression with what she would say? Like, where is the joke? He, like you said, it's like as if like he's not doing a comedy bit. No. He's doing a performance piece, which <laughs> imagine if I were on The View and wearing a wig and wearing lipstick. But then can tell This them, is what it would be like. But then can like deliver the message that I want to deliver. Well, that's anyway. the thing. It's, right. like, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, it's not like it's. He's not playing a character. He's just the character is Dave Rubin, who has a slightly different voice and register, maybe drunk, and as such is wearing a wig and lipstick. red lipstick. And it's amazing, as a one commentator pointed out, to to go through all that work of the lipstick and the wig and stuff, and not write a single joke other than like. Maybe you, maybe the joke was you mentioned Sister Act. The comp, <laughs> right, and Sister Act too. Sister Act was and actually also like, I mean, that was a, a sort of funny uh, jo joke, I guess. I, I mean, well, relative to the other thing, like, it's yeah, a reference. Like, you're great. It's not a joke. It's just I recognize this because yeah. Whoopi Goldberg's on there. But Recognition saying, is not a cute humor. His character was saying, you're great because of these movies, as opposed to you're great because you, you speak your mind on right. The View. You're I mean, yeah. so I, no, I'm saying, I'm not saying it's necessarily a funny joke, but it has a joke construction. Right. right. It's it's conceptual peekaboo. We've talked about this before with conservatives. Just mention something in pop culture, and that's a funny thing. Like if a priest does that at church, like, oh, yeah. you mentioned Lady Gaga. That's right, 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 right. Um, let's play this because I want you to absorb the experience of watching this again now that you know it's coming and you're not shocked and you're able to sort of like, you know, because with the first time you watch it, you're like, when's it coming? Yeah. Where's the twist? What's the joke? And then you're just like, wait, what? Like, it's like you're, you're taking a bus ride and it, there's no stop. It doesn't stop. And then all of a sudden just the bus explodes and in, into flames. It's called speed. And, but then after experiencing it the second time, wait do you see how proud he is of himself <laughs> afterwards. It's fascinating. Handing over to Russia. Yeah. They used to actually investigate stuff like this. And I guess now, exactly. you know, there seems to be no bars. What are you two crazy bitches talking about? What are you talking about? You want to arrest people who are different than you politically? Tulsi Gabbard? She's a member of our military. She's a former congresswoman, a Democrat. You just don't like her, so you want to arrest her? You want to arrest Tucker Carlson, the very dapper Tucker Carlson. I, what are you saying? You you guys are nuts. You're, you're just nuts. I only agreed to do this show because I thought that Whoopi, Whoopi was sane. She was good. Sister Act. Sister Act 2. Anna's just nuts. I don't even know what she's doing here. The other one's a racist. And, the, and the, there's the drunk one. I, what, what, is, what are we all doing here? He's also uh, pointing in the wrong directions relative to where he's looking uh, on the set. But God. Come to hate. You know that? Uh, why am I here? Yeah. I need a haircut. Good question. Okay, now watch this, folks. Hello there. I'm Dave Rubin. <laughs> yes. This is the Rubin Report <laughs> Direct Message. I'm so impressed with myself. <laughs> 
Keep going. Keep going, please. Hello there. I'm Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report Direct Message on today, March 15th, 2022. We are live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and Blaze TV, although after that, we may not be live streaming on YouTube much longer. Uh, yes, that was incredible. So Unearthed, edgy. unedited. Pause it for secret. one second. Pause it for one second. Is he implying, does YouTube have some type of like a QC thing where if something's like so like awe, jaw droppingly unfunny mm -hmm. that it gets pulled down? I thought maybe it was too close to Steven Crowder's uh, intellectual property and that he was going to get a, a copyright, copyright strike. strike. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's just like an elaborate way for him to just kind of shoehorn a, I think, Tucker Carlson's hot thing into the I video? Have no that, idea. Again, like the main joke seems to be like this is a way for him to launder his true feelings about like. Yes, yeah. right. The point, like, if he was actually going to do a parody of it, his female character would be ramping up the like, yeah, we should execute Tulsi Gabbard or right, something exactly. like that, right? Being a part of the the liberal craziness of the view. Yeah, throw in Guantanamo. That should be right. It, yeah. Instead, it's just him in a wig <laughs> with lipstick. And by the way, Tucker Carlson looks great. I think you're also forgetting the fact that he also had a funny point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A wig down his forehead. <laughs> wig. But uh, yeah, he thinks he crushed this. <laughs> oh, he thinks he crushed it. He is like, I can't even believe how how great that was. Are we crazy? Oh my God! That we was just the went... cold open. That was the cold open to his show. You bitch answer. You've become everything you ever hated. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> I don't even understand that in the context of like, even if it was like Dave Rubin came on there, it's like, no, no, they've what? always been like, what are you talking about? All right, let's keep watching it because he's so excited about it. <laughs> yeah. 15th, 2022, we are live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and Blaze TV. Although after that, we may not be live streaming on YouTube much longer. Uh, uh, yes, that was incredible. Unearthed, unedited secret footage from the view yesterday that was guest host uh, darlene rudin uh who was uh, laying down the truth with those lunatics um that's what we're doing around here that's what we discussed doing around here at 8 a.m in the morning don't ask how we got the wig michael had to go to target pick out a few blouses for me and the lipstick great choice in color by the way michael really really you nailed it um, I was very concerned because I didn't, I've never put on lipstick before, believe it or not. And I was very worried that I wasn't going to be able to get it off for the show, but it all kind of worked out. I even managed to get a haircut okay. this morning. Okay. Uh okay. Okay. Darlene Rudin is, so it really is. It's like his alter ego. Yeah, that's the yeah. point. I, I want to see more from Darlene Rudin. I do too. <laughs> I do too. In fact, I'm going to make a maybe not so bold prediction that in 15 years, it's only Darlene Newt, Rudin. Whoa. Yes. That uh, the know, Ruben the report has been, uh, it, yeah, he's, oh, no. This is after he gets kicked off the, the blaze when the audience um, gets you know, uncomfortable with that sort of thing. Right. Like, like when he has to address the rollback on the right of uh, gay people to marry. Mm -hmm. uh, and Beck is like, Dave, you just got to take one for the team. Uh, what are the chances you guys can get divorced? And the whole thing falls apart. And then he's out there doing cabaret as Darlene Rudin. Bitches won't ever listen to me. <laughs> and in unrelated news, tomorrow, uh, Samantha Sider will be opening the show. That's right. <laughs> Samantha Sider will be there, you bitches. <laughs> <laughs> and she's going to talk about how Social Security is easily solvent, you idiots! You pick up everything you didn't want to be at, TYT, Dave. Postal uh, banking! That's but right! Postal banking is the... It would be so much more efficient. It would also provide banking services to people who can't get it now. <laughs> oh, God, you... <laughs> <laughs> the joke with me. You're finally oh your true god. self. Oh my god! As soon as I'm, I'm serious. If he, if he continues this, 
if if what is her name Geraldine Rudin shows Darlene up Rudin. Darlene, Darlene Rudin Geraldine. I, I I may I may do an entire show as a parody of Darlene Rudin mm -hmm. actually yeah that's a call to action Samantha Sider Folks, if you're on YouTube right now, go to that uh, video. It's called Tulsi Gabbard Ruins Mitt Romney's Treason Accusations and say, more Darlene Rudin. More Darlene Rudin. Because the comments are kind of overlooking that skin a little bit. There's a <laughs> yep. few people who mentioned it, but most people are just saying, yeah, defend Tulsi, um, which you know, I don't think she should be investigated for you know, statements like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yes, go say more Darlene Rudin, demand it, because if, you, if we don't get more Darlene Rudin, I'm worried that it's being canceled in-house and Glenn Beck's not yes. supporting Dave Rubin's creativity. I, there is no doubt in my mind that they're walking around there going, that was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. Honestly. Glenn Beck's watched it like eight times. Dave, this is the type of thing you should be doing He needs some positive reinforcement. The time. He needs it. And this is, this is what we need. Everybody, gather around. Let's hear it for Dave. Or Darlene, should we say. <laughs> My God, I'm so, my mind is so fucking blown by that. I can't even, I can't even tell you. I cannot tell you. That is, oh God, if I could take that and put it in a frame. Uh, day in day, Denmark. Hi, Sam. I'm some months older than you, and it's my birthday. Living in a country with democratic socialism has been the ultimate gift for a U.S. expat. But a show far from you would come in a close second. Whoa. Much love to all from a longtime member. You want a show far? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Sam's not here right now, but he'll have to get one from Samantha Sider. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Toot on that, <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> Stupid bitches. Stupid God, you've become everything you hated. <laughs> Oh my God. I feel like we should have done a whole show. <laughs> Just a whole show on that. Incidentally, if you're coming to the live show, we're just going to play that. Yeah. The whole show That's is going to be the cold open. Out. It's going to be the finale. <laughs> cold, <laughs> cold open. We're going to come out, introduce ourselves, and then just put that on a loop for two hours. And Samantha might be at the bell house. Oh my God, you know she's going to be drinking exactly what Sam drinks. <laughs> Box wine for you bitches. Oh my God. Salsa Sakari is not going in salt. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, Meaty Hooks, really annoying day at work today. Thanks for always making my day a bit better. You're welcome. Valley Girl. Wow, Sam, you're such a human. Coughing? Really? Talia from Tampa. Hey, Sam and Emma, me again, but complaining about Florida for a different reason than rent. As a young trans woman, I really wish the DOJ would start prosecuting the executive branch of the state for enforcing laws that violate the Constitution, such as transgender laws and abortion laws. The Supremacy Clause and the 14th Amendment aren't enforced. They don't exist. Um, I, I think like the, the Supreme Court has shown that the uh, supremacy clause is only valid when they decide it's valid. Left of the box, I tested positive for COVID yesterday. Oy, I have no idea where I caught it. I'm triple vaxxed, wear masks in public, and keep my contact with others low. So far, it feels like a cold, but I'm worried about long COVID. I'm vulnerable to some of the outcomes I've heard about. It's frustrating. Our governments are dropping mandates when the numbers are going up, and they don't include the thousands of people like me who have a positive test taken at home, indeed. There's only so much you can do to protect yourself when the people around you stop taking it seriously, but it's important to continue to doing what you can to prevent the spread. If wearing a mask means one less person has to go through this, then I'll gladly keep it on. Keep safe, everyone. I, I, I wear it in, um, in, in almost all the circumstances I wore it before. Is this in being in Spain, uh, people don't seem to have a problem with wearing masks even outside um people just seem to have it up and i know they had like minor anti-mask stuff in spain in 2020 but um it seemed pretty i don't know it seemed even compared to new york um people were really compliant mm. well i was in utah uh 
Not not the case there. Nobody. 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 Not I've a person. I've been in a bar in North Dakota that the one of the owners was uh, died from COVID. And another owner was severely maimed by it, and nobody wears even the um, people who work there wear masks. Hmm. Late boomer. Me again. Reed Shibber. Um. His view of cultural Marxism as only academic overlooks that the U.S. right wing has used Gramsci's ideas better to create dominant political power, also anti-worker, than the U.S. left wing. Perception and politics matter. Even in working class struggles for better living conditions and more political power, he is reproducing a simplistic Marxist economic -tist, uh, model of the human being as utility maximizing, only self-interested, kind of like neoclassical economics. I don't think he is um I don't think he's jettisoning the stuff that you think he's jettisoning. I think he's trying to integrate it um more than and 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 that may not have come out in the interview in the way that it probably should have. And that would be more of a function of me, I think. Uh Hayden from Texas. Ha ha, oh my god, I'm just speechless. Can we attribute McCarthyism to the stabilization of the working class? I mean, maybe the fall of the Soviet Union in terms of, like, the end-of-history neoliberal part that he was talking about. I don't know. I mean, yeah, McCarthyism was a response to workers' movements, definitely. Train boy, what if instead of a no-fly zone, it was a no-fly zone and nobody could wear cool clothes there and you had the, the slightest bit of drip, you get murdered? Okay. Uh, Giga Daniel Ocean. Holy cow. Hearst would be proud to see that the press is upholding the legacy of yellow journalism. Is the press really hoping WW3 will save their industry? I, I don't think it's, I honestly don't think for the most part that these people are, are pushing war because of the value to the industry. I think it is the, the value of their own individual careers because it is part of their branding. I mean, it's doing wonders for people like Michael McFall. Without a doubt. I, I just think the whole like structure of their particular field incentivizes that, though. I think so. I think or so. it's just like a self-selecting process in terms of who wants to who wants to be in on the action. But I think if we were to, well, I guess it may get you more access is the argument on some level. But when you're in the White House press press room. I, I I think that it really is about this the 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 culture in that in the beltway that suggests if you're willing to promote war, you're a serious thinker. Mm. I mean, I just think that like probably the, helps your sourcing. The, well, it might, it Ooh. might, it might, but if you're wet White House press, it, it, it's it, it's, it's sort of irrelevant, right? I mean, those those people don't. Uh, I guess it's separate and distinct from foreign correspondence, where I think maybe my critique applies more, but and also Matt's because of the like the sourcing. Without a doubt, in in yeah, undoubtedly beat sweetener type of situation, and also I think you're you know some people are either inclined to be pro war or specifically anti war uh, if they become a war correspondent, like, it's not like a, I'm, I'm neutral about the whole war thing no. uh, type of situation. I mean, just look at what's his name, Richard Engel. And then you get, a yes, sense. yes. I think this is a guy who's like, I, if I could embed with the, uh, with the airborne Rangers every time I would do it. But, um, I, I just think that there's a, there's just a culture where like, if you're willing to make those hard decisions, that's why also we need to send more people to war and we need to cut Social Security. Yeah. Those are the two things. Mm -hmm. Doodles. Wait, you cut off the press corps video before Ryan Grimm gets pushed back for asking about U.S. providing diplomatic support? Oh, did we, was that tagged on the back of the end of that? It was? I, I thought it was a separate video. Here is, I, I wanted to play this. Let's play this Ryan Grimm thing. So Ryan Grimm, from The Intercept, was at the uh, White House uh, press corps yesterday while all the other reporters were basically asking, like, why aren't you getting more involved in this war? Why can't we have more involvement in this war? And he asked a very um, uh, key question here, that the U.S. is refusing at this point to engage in direct negotiations with the Russians. Um, 
I can come up with a response to that on both sides of that uh, is that, you know, maybe the U.S. doesn't want to make this about U.S. Russia. This is, you know, uh, but they, on the other hand, maybe they need assurances from Russia uh, about things like NATO or whatever it is, or troop movements or, or you know, uh, military hardware uh, movements. At the same time, the question is, well, okay, if you're not going to engage, like how much, how empowered is Zelensky to negotiate certain things that have to do with things like NATO expansion? Here is, um, here is uh, Ryan Grimm asking that, quen- uh, that question of Jen Psaki. Go ahead. So, aside from the request for weapons, President Zelensky has also requested that the U.S. be more involved in negotiations toward a peaceful resolution to the war. What is the U.S. doing to push those negotiations forward? Well, one of the steps we've taken, a significant one, is to be the largest provider of military and humanitarian and economic assistance in the world to put them in a greater position of strength as they go into these negotiations. We also engage and talk to the Ukrainians on a daily basis. And the president and this national security team has has uh, rallied the world in being unified in their opposition to the actions of President Putin. So those are the steps we're taking. We also engage uh, oftentimes before and after any conversations that any of these uh, global leaders are having with both Russians and Ukrainians and encourage them to make sure they're engaging with Ukrainians directly. But would Zelensky be empowered by the United States to reach an agreement with Russia and have U.S. sanctions released as a result? Well, he's the leader of Ukraine, so he's empowered to have a negotiation with Russia, and we're here to support those efforts. Again, I'm not going to get ahead of a negotiation, but we are here to support those efforts. We discuss and have conversations with him, with his team on a daily basis. Go ahead, George. All right. This is really important because, um, uh, you know, Grim asks, what what is the U.S. doing to uh, further the negotiations? And her response is, well, we're basically empowering Ukraine so that when they enter into these negotiations, they have more, they have uh, more leverage. leverage. Exactly. But then he asks, do they have authority to speak to some of the material uh, questions that Russia may want at this time, which in the wake of sanctions and and uh, these things, which would be like reversal of the sanctions, unfreezing of, uh, you know, my yacht and, uh, but also, you know, obviously um, uh, other things. What about uh, Nord Stream? Uh, stream? Um, and the question is, how can Zelensky negotiate a, uh, like, if, if Zelensky has to sit down with Russia and say, like, oh, I, I got to go in the back yeah. and ask my manager if I can do that, because it has to do it for all of these things. You're, you're not, Zelensky's not negotiating. Zelensky is a messenger and, and a mediator between the, you know, part of that negotiation. So, and it also undercuts Zelensky in any conversation that he may have, because like, the, the, this is not, this is not a serious conversation. Right. Like, let me talk to the person who, right. let me talk to your manager. Then. Right. Yeah. Why am I talking to you now? With that said, it's also possible just, we should be aware of this. So that we have like a, like a really a 360 view of this is that, um, the administration doesn't want to say what Zelensky has the authority to bring, because there's a reason why, when you go in for that, buy that car, the guy pretends that his manager's in right. the other room because I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. That's, that's all part of the negotiation. I think that's part of it too. It, right. I mean, it certainly could be. Yes. And so um, the, you know, people should be aware of that. But the question is really an important one. And the, the answer to that question is a really important one. It's not necessarily important that we know. But it's really how it's being addressed in that moment, and 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 it, it there should be, you know, that is a far more productive line of questioning that uh, should be happening in that room than just like why aren't you bombing more? Well, because if you're if you're abandoning the diplomatic route and you're pouring weapons into and and uh, arms into Ukraine, which I I do think is understandable in terms of giving them defense. Uh, capabilities. But if you're abandoning the diplomatic route, then we're back to like the Hillary Clinton clip from Maddow, which is essentially like there are forces in that room, potentially, we don't know. Again, that's why Ryan's question is so good. Um, 
but there could be forces in the room with Biden essentially saying, let's let this play out because Putin could get weakened. And that is a terrible situation to use Ukraine's Ukraine, the over 40 million people that live there as a proxy for weakening Putin. And that's a terrifying prospect. And I think like that's some of what Ryan's hitting on there. Yes, because if Zelensky is saying, I want the U.S. involved in negotiations, he must be feeling that the that it's not helpful to have to say, like, you're asking me to do stuff that I'm not authorized to do. Yeah. Um, and that is going to slow the roll, as it were. And, and there are forces in the United States that want that roll slowed. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Without a, uh, without a doubt. Um, folks, we get time for... We don't have time for one more. Can call. we do that Candace Owens clip? Let's oh, I want to do, I want to do okay. uh, all right, all right. also 11 because this is really important too. Um, and then we can also do the, we can do the Jesse Waters one. I'm sorry, folks, about the phone calls. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll start doing like a, just a, you know, I keep saying that like a, like a, just one, one, like a, an one hour a week day. where we do a, yeah. a just. But I just think, I think like we gave you so much with the Dave Rubin clip. We had to go along on that. Yeah. We had to, had to. All right. Um, oh, there's a couple of these. Um, you want to play the Idaho one, or do you want to play the one the? Um, I don't know. You dealer's choice. Okay. Where, where's which? Where's where's the Tennessee one? Okay, this is really important. Not quite as fun, but it's really important. Um, we, this is happening. It is happening right now. We've been talking about. I mean, in 2016, I was having debates with idiots that um, it really does matter who's sitting on the Supreme Court. We now have a 6-3 majority on the Supreme Court, which has given a blessing to the idea that states can get around the violation of the constitutional right for a woman to get an abortion by empowering other citizens to essentially engage in harassment suits. That's essentially what they are. To get the material ability to provide an abortion, to fulfill that right, to uh, quash that material ability. And the Supreme Court signed off on that mechanism. The Texas Supreme Court just uh, two days ago said, there's no state for you to sue, so the law stands. And now we're seeing Idaho. We're seeing um, Tennessee. What was the other Missouri. state? Missouri. They are all doing this. And in Tennessee, this Democratic uh, state legislator uh, asking of the Republican who's sponsoring the bill, guy's name, um, uh, the 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 sponsor of the bill is Rebecca Alexander, introduces this copycat piece of legislation. It's similar to um, Idaho, I think it is, that is saying a rapist can't sue a woman for getting an abortion because that would be absolutely wrong because you wouldn't want a rapist who has raped and impregnated a woman to have the right to sue. But everybody else can and any family member of the so-called pre-born child can. And Maybe. we should say the rapist has to be proven to be a rapist and something like I, I, in the single digit percentages of rapes are actually ever successfully prosecuted, so. This bill is modeled directly after the legislation passed in Texas last year. Abortions since that bill has been passed has dropped 60% in Texas um, since that bill was passed. While the Texas law prohibits abortion, once medical professionals can detect cardiac activity, usually around six weeks, the Tennessee language proposes to prohibit all abortion. Courts have blocked other states from imposing similar all restrictions, abortion. but this law differs significantly because it leaves enforcement up to private citizens through civil lawsuits instead of criminal prosecutors. The Texas Supreme Court recently upheld this bill, ensuring this bill remains in the Texas law for the unforeseeable future. So um, you could have um, a rapist 
one in five, maybe one in six women in Tennessee are victims of, of rape. And you could have a rapist and uh, that rapist could impregnate a, a young lady, a minor, and uh, the rapist's mother or father could bring suit against that minor uh, if they decided to get an abortion, if this passes? The representative. The bill states that a rapist, sexual assault, or incest cannot bring a charge against the woman that has harmed. So, Representative Freeman, that wasn't the question I asked. I'm sorry. I asked if their parent, sibling, friend, neighbor, spouse could bring suit against the minor who was raped to force them to pay a $10,000 dollar fine if they uh, decide to have an abortion. Representative. Can we go out of session for legal to specify that? Um, any objections? We'll go out of session. Uh, Representative Freeman. I, I would appreciate the, the sponsor's opinion. Mm. Uh, mm. Would, would you have an opinion? My assumption is that they could because it's any citizen. So yes. Other I, than the rapist. I don't I don't need to go out of session. Okay. I think that's, that's actually, I okay. think, the correct answer. Okay. okay. That, um, that state rep uh, was Bob Freeman, and that law is saying that if you get an abortion, any citizen has the right to sue you for $10,000. I'm unclear as to can multiple citizens sue you for $10,000? Or I think the, the state will – wait, is this – the ten thousand dollars coming out of the pocket of the woman who gets the abortion, of or course. Is this the bounty system set up by the state. I, I think this is um, this is uh, that you can sue the person getting the abortion. You may be able to sue. There may be other people you can sue, um, who help uh, provide the abortion. And then, like you know, me as an entrepreneur, I sue. Me as the rapist brother, or the mother of a rapist. I can make $10,000 off of my uh, cousin, my uh, son, my uh, whatever, raping Your someone, victim. Yeah. being aware that they're getting an abortion, pay for his defense. I could pay for the defense of my, uh, my child or my cousin or whatever it is for raping somebody by making the woman who got the abortion because of that rape, I could pay for his defense. See how twisted this is. And, and it's going to go from $10,000 and then they'll amend it after they, uh, after this is laws in effect for a while, it'll be 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, $50,000. And this is going to happen in 10 to 20 states and it's going to happen it's within a year or two yeah that bill has been advanced uh it's moving forward to this the I committee mean, and or, uh yeah the full committee and this is a function of the supreme court saying that this workaround to our constitutional rights is fine and the caller that we had yesterday had a point the dynamic's a lot trickier when it comes to, let's say, guns. If we want to, like, tit for tat on this, it's trickier. And, and, and here's the other thing that's tricky. They don't give a shit about the legal principles associated with this at the Supreme Court. Like, it is, the, you know, the fig leaf now, that whole thing, that's done. Then, then I am going to bother with the fig leaves. It's going to be like, you know, Amy Coney Barrett, can you write this up over the weekend? Yeah. Maybe a rapist needs to, like, buy some insurance beforehand, that kind of deal. Or if you're going to have sex at all, maybe you need some insurance because if the woman gets pregnant from that, has an abortion, they're going to be the one that has to pay. Needs to be, uh, of course not. It's just always on the burden of the woman, but... And make no mistake, the Supreme Court, if they look at this law, I don't know uh, why they would at that point, they probably would never accept the case. They don't care that it outlaws, bans abortions, period. Or it makes you subject to a lawsuit of $10,000 for an abortion, period. The whole, you know, fake fetal heartbeat thing, that was, doesn't matter. 
once you once you uh, back off that standard in Roe v. Wade, it, it's all you're off to the races. Yeah. I mean, why couldn't I sue you for ten thousand dollars because you got birth control? Like, why wouldn't morning after and, Bill? And I, I forget morning after. I mean, morning after, of course. Same thing. It's an aborto fast. From their perspective, it would be would be abortion. They'll conflate that. That will be next, and then it will be birth control. I, I guarantee you, there will be a state law lawmaker in one of these states. We're going to be talking about birth control. It's going to start with like age. You cannot get birth control until you're twenty twenty one. I I I will guarantee yeah. you it, and there will be a state that will pass it. And 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 the, and it will go like this. If you are in any way aid and abet a woman under the age of 21 getting birth control, you are subject to a $10,000 lawsuit. If you are a doctor who prescribes it, if you are a pharmacist who fulfills that uh, prescription, if you are a parent, mark my words, we will see that within a couple of years. Mark my words. An investigation like we're seeing in terms of parents providing gender affirming care for their trans kids. Same thing. This is the, once they figured out this mechanism, it passes uh, Supreme Court um, a muster. We're off to the races. This is it. How about uh, getting that HPV vaccine? I mean, when you're a kid, it promotes promiscuity. We yeah, all. I'm, I mean, yeah, you're grooming. That, that's literally what like the Santas spokespeople are saying. That's basically tantamount to grooming children. This is where we're at, ladies and gentlemen. I know the courts don't matter, but guess what? They matter. And, and, and hey, they matter for me. They matter for our daughters and and you other, guys. I mean, because fear matters to you guys. And this isn't like you know, like this is just one massive section of our rights in this country. The other part, just want to keep in mind. This is, a, this is a 360 thing. For some reason, you're just not so concerned about a, a, a woman have a right to um, have sovereignty over her own body or the right of people who are of age of consent to get uh, birth control. And you just think that, like, well, material uh, concerns are, are most important. Well, I got news for you. OSHA... EPA, FDA, forget about it. Also, I, th th this is a material concern. I, I, this I is mean, a material concern. Yeah. Um, Vinny Holiday says, what's their end goal? End goal. I mean, this is it. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the society they want. They want there to be... Um, well, I think the end goal is, is you, you get the women back into the kitchen. I mean, that's really the end goal, right? Like once you take a woman's right to make a determination about her own body and her, uh, right to, uh, not get pregnant in the first place, you debilitate her ability to, um, have any economic independence. Mm -hmm. I mean, theocracy is the end goal. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could also say theory. it's a lifestyle. <sighs> um, what well, a roller coaster of emotions this show is today. Yeah, we hit every one of them. Let's just let's rack it up. Let's go number eleven. Let's do number twelve. Which one? Oh, twelve. You want to do number twelve, or do you want to do an eleven? Which one? Um, I you again. You pick. You are you are the boss. <laughs> <laughs> A number 11's long. Let's let's do 12. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard Candace Owen uh, opine about Hitler and uh, European history and, um, oh gosh, all sorts of things. Here is... Um, so now she's just responding to like... I, so I, I'm not sure why the audience is behind her. This is a new set choice, right? 
Well, they do this. They, you know, you see shows that do this. Sort of. I yeah, mean, no, like, it looks shows. like whose line is it anyway or something right. like that. But, right. Yeah. They did that. I mean, this is a way of showing that there are actually people in her audience. Human beings approve of this. Yes. yes. <laughs> Maybe they heard our critique because there was like no way to actually verify if there was anybody in the audience. There was never like a overhead, overhead shot. It was just her and then like one person clapping like this. So, yeah. That's actually not impossible to imagine that. Sometimes we get under people's skin. Mm. It's happened. Mm. Now, this is absolute 100% proof that there are 16 people there in her audience. Play. We've got some mean tweets that I haven't seen yet. <laughs> so we're going to read some of them. This is going to oh. be fun. Oh, someone said to friend. me, okay, I guess this is in response to a, a tweet where I said, I'm the only person who has considered how pulling out of Afghanistan and starting a war with Russia are related from an energy policy perspective. And Anthony said, hey, McFly, we didn't start a war with Russia. Putin didn't even start a war. He started a genocidal colonization. Where are you? Ukraine is defending itself and the rest of the world from an authoritarian regime. And all you can think about is fossil fuel profitability. Wow, a genocidal colonization is interesting. Again, going back to my point of people being stupid, you know, trying, he's not trying to commit a genocide of the Ukrainians. That obviously makes no sense because there's, there's very, uh, there, there is no difference ethnically from Ukrainians and Russians. Obviously, Ukraine wasn't a thing until 1989. Ukraine was created by the Russians. It was, you know, they speak Russian. So it's absolutely hmm. ridiculous. So that like hold on, hold on. You, you want to stop it here because that's kind of it. I a think. few things. Well, I know well, I, we need to keep going. I want to see where she's going with this. But I mean, the fascinating thing is like, uh, does she spend any time on the actual point, or is it just on the semantics of genocidal? Right. Yeah. That's what she's trying to use. If it was that's... homicidal, she right. would have been like, well, it's technically not homicide because it is taking place in the context of war. Right. And uh, but this is interesting. Uh, and again, this entire episode has been exposing to you how ignorant people are about the goals of Vladimir Putin. He has goals. Uh, the goal is not to just get rid of Ukrainians. Um, that makes entirely no sense. It would not be helpful for him. Uh, so I would just encourage that guy to get a little more educated. Second mean tweet. Who yeah, is see, yeah, there you go. Right, right there. Like yeah. he's not addressing any. She's not addressing anything. She's finding out. Like I also noticed that he spelled uh, genocidal wrong, or at least that's what I'm being told. She She's learning from Glenn Greenwald or something it, like that. Yeah, exactly. Is it so simple that um, uh, my understanding is that they don't just simply speak Russian, that there's a no. separate Ukrainian language? No, of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, she's she's making all that up. I mean, the idea She's that, like, not, though. She's taking it from that. I, I'm almost positive she's taking it from Putin's essay from last year about like the uh, historical and cultural ties between Ukrainians and Russians, which is like the pretext for essentially his imperialism here um, and denying the sovereignty of Ukraine for the the many you know centuries of culture there and that's like it I, her response here is I mean she's she's not smart but it's interesting to me because the right wing is like almost acting like the left for the first time in a while here in that they are completely unable to coalesce behind a coherent message about what's happening in Ukraine like. We saw Tucker go full pro Putin at the beginning and, you know, Trump did too. They saw that polled really well. Now everybody, every Republican at the State of the Union standing up, you know, clapping for Biden's response. Um, you have the traditional hawks like Lindsey Graham, who was like, yeah. let's go assassinate him, boom, whatever. Sean Hannity always in the same camp. Um, and then Tucker kind of, I think, had to weaken his position a bit. And then you have just rubes like, uh, like, uh, Candace Owens here, who's essentially just saying what Putin said. That's his line of thinking about his invasion. She's just regurgitating it. So there's no real coherent message that they're coming out of here uh, with this here. Um, and I think it's at least in the short term an issue for them. Who's going to tell her about uh, what existed where we are, uh, <laughs> you know, 200 years ago or how uh, big the United States was uh, back at the turn of the century? Yeah, I don't think she quite um, responds to land back our arguments the same uh, <laughs> level. Of like, yeah. Who cares, man? It's just a nation state. It's just created. It's all a social construct. <laughs> California? That didn't exist. I mean, there are French speakers in Canada. Should France invade? 
In fact, in Canada, they speak English. That's our language. We're basically the same country. It just doesn't exist. It really is. Um, it, it, she's walking a tight, uh, a, a tight wire. If if she, I mean, she, I think she genuinely had not seen that uh, tweet before. Like, give me the hate tweets without seeing it. Oh, yeah, that's shoot. another good segment that should be encouraged. Is her responding yes. to Trump on stuff? Exactly. Yeah, I, but I am annoyed by like this trend of mean tweets. That's, I mean, it, it, they took it from Jimmy Kimmel, and now everybody's doing it, like reading digs about you on the internet. I don't find that, it, I mean, for political commentators, it's interesting, but like she's trying to be, I don't know, some sort of talk show host light with it. It, it's, it, it doesn't work. Um, should we do that, uh, that Jesse Waters one? Which one is that? Oh. Yeah, number four. Is that it? Was that number four? Three or four. Which one do you want to do? <sighs> you guys want right, to... Let's do the laptop back. We can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, shoot. Do we have time for this? Yeah, I, don't know if we have time. I don't think we have time for this. Sorry. Uh, let's do some IMs and then we're out of here. You're going to have a lot of stuff to do tomorrow, Emma. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop by. <laughs> <sighs> My God. I don't, uh, folks, let me apologize in advance for the next eight months when I am constantly breaking out in Samantha Cider. <laughs> if Dave Rubin does, uh, does that again, it's going to be over for, I mean, you um, honestly, I mean, all of you turn we off. We might your, just like float up to heaven a, 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 or a, Sam at least. People, people are going to have to like, just make the decision. Like I, I had to give up the majority report because Dave Rubin did his character one time. And then Sam became so obsessed. So amazed by the whole thing that he started doing entire shows as Samantha Cider. Samantha Cider already one ups the quality of writing though, because there's the joke about like cider as if it's an alcohol. But da D Darlene Rudin. I didn't even realize that. Like he just changed Darlene Rudin. Is there Rudin? I that's what I did. I changed it to a, a the E to an I. <laughs> Bitches. <laughs> you. You know what, Matt? You oh really, God. you really become everything you hated. <laughs> That's you know? the part that I like the most. Like, why am I here? I like the part where he's like actually thinking, like, did this, did this why? maybe not go as well? As why am I here? I also like the wrinkle that he did it at eight in the morning, as you said. Like, damn, really? Got up early for this. It's weird. Is the target was open at eight? That seems whatever. Okay. Uh, uh, from MNC, every member of that press corps should be kept pushing for a no-fly zone, should be sent to the Ukrainian front lines with only a javelin, since we apparently, they all have a death wish. We can call them the no-fly zone unit. North Dakota Llama. Question for Matt. Do you ascribe to the great person theory of history or social conditions trait theory? I lean towards the latter, but admit that the former fascinates me as well. Uh, yeah, I think the latter is probably um, more explanatory if you could access it. But I think great man theory of history is just it's easy to access because uh, great men, so so called, leave behind a giant paper trail and um, are often sort of like like Napoleon. Reading about Napoleon, you can learn a lot about certain parts of society and power structures in Europe, for instance. Um, but I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I don't think um, I think individuals are often like uh, Hegel embodiments of a sort of world historical spirit. I don't know. I, I, I think you're right. I, I don't, I'm not a great man theory of history person, but I like re, uh, learning about history of um, notable people. I, I, I think that there's like a, a one fifth element though to it. Do you know, like the story of, uh, I, I, I recently read this, like I knew how broad strokes, how world war one started, but did you, do you know the history of that assassination attempt? Oh, so, there was like a well, near so, miss almost. Yeah, you know, there, there was a near miss. So, uh, the uh, Ferdinand, the the Duke of uh, of uh, uh, Austria Hungary, uh, Austria Hungary. I think it was like he was in a car, and uh, they had sent assassins to kill him, and there was like six of them, and uh, like they 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 messed up, 
there's five of them yeah. that got shot or, or, or arrested. And so they said, okay, meet us back at the barracks. And so all of the protection for the Duke went to mm. the, the, the barracks um, with the, the five that they captured. The random one ran off. And the driver of the Duke took a wrong turn. Instead of going to the barracks, went somewhere else. And when they were about to turn around, they just happened to come upon the assassin. And that's when the assassination took place. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, other people are saying, like, you know, something like that might happen and it would cause a world war eventually. So maybe they could, that was just the straw that broke the camel's back, but there could have been a different straw. But I think in the context of, like, like I'm against um, the idolization of Abraham Lincoln in terms of, like, statues for, for the reasons of the social condition theory that I think needs to be emphasized. But if you look back at the Civil War, I think there is a role played by Abe Lincoln uh, temperament in general. And I think we're lucky that we had him in there and not other types of folks. Um, and I think the, the assassination of Lincoln and the subsequent, um, you know, um, neutering of reconstruction by um, Johnson it shows that. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there is a, I think there's a, a, I think there is something to be said. Like, I don't know if, if you didn't have a Zelensky in Ukraine, well, you know, certainly the last, you know, eight years, Following the 2014 uh, Crimea and the you know and and the 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 fighting in the Donbas changed, I think the Ukrainians' own self perception, and, and and you know you gotta keep in mind that like, this is a fairly nascent um, you know sort of independent country. But if you have somebody who's you know who's like if Zelensky decides like you know I think I'm gonna go I think I am gonna go and stay and fight guys yeah. It's hard to make an assessment. I mean, and it's it's hard to know, like, would they get a billion dollars in military support? Because people are like, well, Zelensky's not even going to stick. You know, like, it's, it's, I think these things are sufficiently um, complicated and codependent that it's it's hard to say one or the other, right? I mean, it really is just like a, what percentage and the, to the extent that it does depend on personalities of, say, leaders that aren't entirely democratically accountable, that's one of the reasons to move towards more democratization and against, say, feudalism, where you have just like Habsburgs and folks like that making right. all these decisions. Colorado Boomer. Emma, thank you for the laugh. I was just thinking about your public doesn't know what a fly zone means. And then you said, I was a bully. Good stuff. Yeah, I was not a bully. It's just comedic effect. But I mean, I'm sure I had bully moments, right? We have. Right, we have all, but I think I, I was nice. I'd like to think so. Not my pope. Talk of the no-fly zone recalls the naval blockade of Cuba. Emma can comment from her conversation with Martin Sherwin on how truly close to the apocalypse we were. I don't remember anything. Militant apathy. Welcome to my world. Yeah. Uh, the second, uh, uh, Sam doing some big boy math. I don't agree with all of them, but you have the most intelligent callers, guests, and listeners and crew. Second, Biden does that. The Republicans will pull the rug out. Remember Syria and red line? Yeah, of course. Biden can. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, the end goal is they want America to look like Saudi Arabia. Uh, kid tested, Paul Bureau approved. This Rubin clip sends chills down my spine. Depressed Canadian. Hey, Sam, although racism, a major part of the overwhelming reaction to the Ukraine invasion and subsequent refugee crisis and crimes against civilians, Another larger reason to the near universal condemnation is due that uh, to that a Russian invasion is the first direct existential military threat that is once again at Europe's borders as Ukraine was a sovereign democracy. Most of the major conflicts over the last 40 years, from Panama to Iraq to Serbia to Afghanistan, have all been ruled by our client dictatorships, some form or another. So the idea of a democratic European nation being invaded by a neighboring European dictatorship has been unthinkable for 40 years. Uh, maybe. Jay Tingle. The Hindenburg was an airship that carried nearly 100 people across an ocean. Blimps that just get lost from helium are just an untethered billboards. But to your point, I remember when one summer 50 years ago when my grandfather saw the good Goodyear blimp on the horizon and started shouting excitedly, a dirigible, a dirigible. We had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> uh, Rory Gatto. 
It's like my granddad always said, ABC, always be organized the working class into unions and other worker co-ops. <laughs> uh, guess had some good stuff. We should all be Marxists. Uh, Christopher Peterson. Kudos to the woman who provided calm and counsel on behalf of an aggressive and obviously distraught patron who was being restrained by security outside of the bell house Thursday. If you're out there, yours was a keen display of de-escalation skill. Nonetheless, it was a very fun evening. So thanks for all participants. Tiffany Caban was a particularly great. And thanks to Sam for signing the box containing my Dennis Miller doll. Bop, bop, bop. All right. Three more. Another long hauler. No existential dread growing up as an Xer. Nope, nuclear holocaust was never a thing we worried about. Vinny Holiday. Uh, do you think this might hurt their chances at the midterms? I, you know, it's a function of how uh, Democrats do. I, I... Ryan from Los Angeles. Uh, I wish Michael here w w was here for the Rubin bit. Yeah, I did too. Hey, 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 the Rogan fan that called last week because it was a medical kind of guy, and just because he had no idea how medical scientific research goes, not mean he was pulling things out of his arse. All right, uh, what did I say, two or three more? Uh, majority Report wardrobe coordinator. I've had the same question about multiple people can sue if the same abortion. Can 50 people sue at once and it costs 500000 Are we going to see a cottage industry of lawsuit mobs? Yes, we will see some cottage industry. Will people accuse political opponents of helping someone get an abortion and use this to tie them up in courts and bankrupt them? Uh, I don't even think we've begun to understand how how this is going to, how effed up this is going to be. All right, three more. Staley, Dan Christ. When Ruben Clip aired, the kids in the hall suddenly felt a cold shiver. Champagne commie, the only cultural max Marxism I see is all the goddamn marks that fall for grifters like Jimmy Dore and Dave Rubin. Bap, bap, bap. And the final I am of the day. Avino, hey, Sam, how do you get that self-hating, worn out, limp dick, disheveled look? Trying to get that for myself. It all comes with time and experience. <laughs> Matt, Bradley, Emma. Good job today. I will be back Friday. Emma will be here tomorrow. Samantha Sider. We'll be, be always here forever. Always with us. Forever. Always with us, bitches. Bye-bye. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright Somewhere the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid